Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon. This is the August 16th, 2022 meeting of the Landmark Preservation Commission. I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Um, let's start with introductions of the commissioners. Uh, I'm, I'll get started. I'm Kelly Wemple. I'm an architect nominated by the American Institute of Architects. Next, we have George. Hi, I'm George Dennis. Uh, I have the honor and privilege of living in a Denver landmark home, and I was nominated by History Colorado. Great, Graham. I'm Graham Johnson, a preservation project manager nominated by the Denver Planning Board. And Gary. Uh, hello, I'm Gary Petrie. I'm an architect and I was nominated by the Denver Planning Board. Larry. Hi, I'm Larry Sykes. I'm an architect and I was nominated by History Colorado. And Erica. Hi, I'm Erica Warzel. I'm an architectural historian and preservation consultant nominated by the community at large. All right, that's it for commissioners today. Jen, will you introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Jen Capetto. I'm Landmark Preservation Staff. Great. Okay, um, so we do have one meeting record on our agenda today for approval. Um, and that is for the last meeting, August 2nd. Were there any comments by commissioners? And if not, would someone like to make a motion? No comment, but I will move to approve the meeting record from August 2nd, 2022. Thank you, Graham. Do we have a second? A second. Thanks, Erica. I will call for the vote. George. Uh, I abstain. I wasn't there. <laughs> gotcha. Graham. Aye. Gary. Aye. Larry. Aye. Erica. Aye. And Kelly. Aye. All right. So we have five votes, for, so our motion passes, and the meeting record is approved. Uh, and that was one abstention, which was... Um, Larry, or er, sorry, George. <laughs> um, all right. So um, we have a few. Oh, that's right. I almost skipped to our consent agenda. Um, at the beginning of every Landmark Preservation Commission meeting, we like to hold a uh, time for public comments. We will have public comment periods later for the public hearings and design review projects. So uh, if you'd like to speak on those, you will have an opportunity at a later date. This is typically for general preservation matters. Um, so is there anyone on the line um, who would like to provide a comment? If you're joining us by phone, please dial star nine. That'll raise your hand. If you're joining us by computer, you can use the hand raise button at the lower left corner, or sorry, it's in the middle. It should be of your screen for Zoom. Oh, I do see a hand raise. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me <laughs> let me uh, real fast. Um, there we go. Get the timer up. Uh, general public comment. And so please start with your name and address for the record. You'll have up to two minutes. Yep. And oh, okay. So she's using an older version of Zoom. So I need to promote you to a panelist. So you are going to disappear for a moment and then come right back. So this is Suzanne. I'm moving you over. You'll have to click a button. It says yes. You approve of that. There she goes. All right, Suzanne, you are welcome to unmute yourself when you're ready. Should be at the bottom of your screen. It's going to look a little different. That's video, but not audio. Hmm. Oh, connecting to audio. There we go. That's a... Just a moment. Connecting to audio. It said it wouldn't didn't connect you to audio for some reason. Ah, uh, um, do you want to try to dial in to the meeting um, by phone? No, you're okay with it? Okay, because we'd love to get... Yeah, if you have a comment, you can dial in by phone. The number should be on our website where you joined via Zoom. And let me 
grab that real fast and put it in the oh that'd be uh, great yeah put it in here so that make it bigger la, la, la. there we go and if it has to do with bandwidth sometimes if you turn off your video and just try audio that can help She's, she's mouth, that's okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, we will... Is there anyone else who had any general public comments? Nope, no, no, another hands raised, no. Okay, all right, then we'll go ahead and move forward. Um, next up, we do have um, four items on our consent agenda today. Uh, so these are projects that uh, we'll only discuss if a commissioner um, has an issue and chooses to take them off consent. Otherwise, um, they've been recommended for approval by staff because they meet the design guidelines. So um, commissioners, were there any questions for staff or any objections to the consent agenda items? And seeing as it looks like there aren't, would someone like to make a motion? Madam Chair, I can make that motion. Thanks, Graham. Sure thing. I move to approve consent agenda items number 2022-CLAM-068 for 3435 Albion Street, um, landmark number 358, the Robinson House. Item number 2022-COA-347 at 620 North Ogden Street, 2022-COA-348, 1002 through 1006 East 4th Avenue, and, or and 1006, I think those are two separate addresses, sorry. Uh, 2022-COA-139 at 2818 Welton Street. Great, thanks, Graham. Do we have a second? I'll second. Uh, I think that was kind of a tie. I think I heard George. <laughs> we'll go with that. Uh, all right, let's call for the vote. George. Aye. Graham. Aye. Gary. Aye. Larry. Aye. Erica. Aye. Kelly. Aye. All right, we have a unanimous vote and the motion passes. So if you're joining us today for one of the projects that's on the consent agenda, you're free to hop off the call unless you'd like to see the rest of the meeting um, because your project has been approved. All right, so next we have two public hearings on our agenda today. You can see um, on the screen the process for public hearings. I'll go ahead and announce uh, the project and um, in this case, uh, we do have someone who needs to recuse, so <laughs> that'll happen. Staff will introduce the application and provide their recommendation, after which we'll hear from the applicant who has up to 10 minutes to present, and then we'll open it up for public comments. Uh, the public comment period for hearings is three minutes per person, and we'll do that the same way we just did. You'll use the hand raise button or dial star nine if you have a comment at that time. Uh, once comments are all received, um, I'll go ahead and close the hearing and the commission will move into deliberation. All right. Okay. I'm going to move Graham right now. And um, Graham, I'm moving you to a, an attendee. And so for the public, he's suddenly froze. Now he's gone. Um, that means he will, um, he can listen to the meeting and watch the meeting, but he, we can't see him or hear him. Uh, and then I'll move him back once all of these Larimer Square projects are over. Great, thanks, Jen. Okay, um, so our first project that's um, getting a public hearing today is number 2022-LM Demo-348, and that's at 1410 through 1440 Larimer Street. So I will go ahead and open the public hearing and Abby, I believe you'll be presenting. Okay, good afternoon. 
So I just wanted to start with a little bit of information for anyone who isn't familiar with our process about why this is requiring a public hearing. Uh, so we do have certain projects that if there's a certain amount of demo involved, it triggers a public hearing versus a regular design review item. Um, so you can see up there kind of a summary on the screen of what requires a public hearing. So any portion of a facade or feature um, that's public facing, that's historic, would try, trigger a public hearing. 40% um, or more of the square footage of the structure's exterior facade wall surfaces, if those are historic wall surfaces, triggers a public hearing. 40% or more of a roof structure area, or 40% more of that wall and roof area combined. Uh, and so with this Abby, I'm sorry, I forgot, uh, sorry to interject, but I did forget to mention uh, for those attending from the general public, um, we did receive some comments just yesterday or some contact uh, saying that um, they'd like this, these projects, these hearings to be postponed because they had a hard time finding uh, the materials and due to finding the materials just a day before um, there was there was some concern about whether they'd have time to review it. So I did just want to acknowledge that we did receive a couple comments um, to that effect and we did verify that all of the ordinance requirements for posting um, was done correctly and um, so we are still moving forward with the hearing today, but I did want the other commissioners to hear that. So um, there were likely a few members of the public who are just, you know, looking at this project starting yesterday rather than a week ago when the materials were posted. But there was public posting on site um, for, I believe, a week and a half, right, Abby? And the materials have been up on the website. So just wanted to acknowledge that um, if we were to postpone this hearing, that would um, necessitate the applicant approving us postponing it. And that's in our ordinance requirements. That's, um, yeah, so just wanted to mention that <laughs> since likely there are probably a couple people who are wondering on the line. Thank you very much for that, Kelly. And I did check with the applicant and the applicant did also say that they preferred to move forward with the public hearing today. So this project has a public hearing. The reason a public hearing has been triggered for this particular item is because that 40% or more of the roof uh, square footage area is being proposed for demolition at the Burger Building and the Sussex Building. So you can see there um, on your know, illustration there of which buildings we're referring to. I know these are some really complex projects that we're looking at today with a lot of inner working parts. So try, <laughs> I will do my best to uh, try to clarify what's involved without going on for too long so that we can get through this meeting. So we're looking at the roof demolition there, the burger in the Sussex. There is also some other associated demo that is also included in this application as well. However, it is non demolition of non-historic features. So on its own, none of the other features would have triggered a public hearing. It is the roof demolition that is triggering public hearing. Um, so um, the applicant has been working closely with staff on developing plans for the block and trying to minimize the amount of demolition needed um, while meeting their goals for activating the block and updating the buildings and the courtyards for improved retail and commercial use while still also retaining historic character. As part of this, it's really just in the, you know, the main historic demo is those roof areas. Okay, so first up here, we have a view of the Sussex roof. Uh, so the entire roof area of the Sussex building is being proposed for demolition. This is due to its poor condition based on an evaluation by KLNA engineers and builders that was conducted in April, 2022. Um, so you can see there is some various mechanical equipment, skylight that are current, skylights currently on the roof. All of that will be uh, removed. Um, a new roof will be installed, but the historic um, you know, parapets uh, will be and 
style notes, those will be retained. Then we also have um, demolition of the burger roof proposed for demolition. This roof is being proposed for demolition um, to accommodate the construction of a new rooftop addition. Uh, so if the commission approves uh, this demolition application, then we will move forward with a review during our design review part of the meeting for a replacement structure, which will be the rooftop addition here. There is no replacement structure proposed for the Sussex besides just putting on a new roof that you know, meets current uh, required engineering standards. Um, so you can see here, top view, again, like the other roof of the Sussex, there is a variety of various mechanical equipment um, that has been added over time. Plan to remove all of that, remove the roof, retain um, and repair existing parapet walls. So you then also have kind of a side view there. The roof there is currently at the rear of the building, these kind of faux mansard mechanical screens, and those are also being proposed for demolition. Uh, so staff find that the roofs of the Burger and Sussex buildings are both flat roofs that really do not have any distinguishing historic character defining features beyond the fact that they are flat roofs. They're not readily visible uh, due to the historic parapet walls, uh, which will be retained and restored. Uh, the roofing material has been replaced numerous times since the, built, since the buildings were constructed and the rooftops have been altered with the installation of various mechanical equipment and screening over time. So then we also have here, going to go through quickly some of the other demolition that was also included in this application. So it, there is the demolition of a non-historic storefront entry um, on the uh, Sussex building there on the left. There is some demolition for new window openings on the Sussex building as well there that you can see that's facing onto the keep courtyard. And then there's also the demolition of the first floor existing um, kind of courtyard facing facade of the Burger building at the keep courtyard. Um, that is also a non-historic feature and that is proposed for demolition as well. Then also proposed for demolition, we have the current Kettle Arcade. This is another non-historic feature. Um, the applicant is proposing to completely kind of remove the later alterations made to the Kettle Arcade, um, just keeping that kind of space, but taking out um, the, kind of the decorative columns and the barrel vault ceiling and other features and storefronts and stairs that have been added um, within the Kettle Arcade. And then finally, at the Bull and Bear Courtyard, they are also proposing to um, remove the sunken courtyard, um, put in a new floor there, um, and so we're going to alter that configuration of that rear courtyard as well. So the application today is this is just for the demolition of these features. Again, as I said, if the Commission approves this demolition, then we will move into a design review um, in the design review portion that talks about what will replace these. Um, staff is recommending approval of the demolition proposed here with the condition that a replacement plan be approved prior to any demolition beginning. Um, staff has based this on the fact that we find the roofs to have limited historic character or integrity and that the demolition of the roofs will not impact the historic character of the buildings. The historic cornices and parapet walls will be retained and restored. Other demolition that is being proposed is limited to non-historic features or areas at the rear with limited visibility. The Larimer Street facades will not be impacted and no significant character defining features will be impacted. Great. Thanks, Abby. Are there any questions for staff? No? All right. Um, let's go ahead and promote the applicants.
And okay, I think that's been done. So um, when you're ready, um, you can go ahead and start your presentation. Please start with your names and addresses for any anyone who uh, plans to speak during the 10 minutes. Uh, please let us know your name and address for the record and the time is yours. All right, uh, thank you. I think I just figured all that out. Can everybody see me? Yes. All right, um, I, my name is Lee Sterrett. Um, I, I live uh, at uh, 1047 Steel Street in downtown Denver. And um, I'm with Perkins and Will, and we're the lead architects for um, the projects here at Larimer Square and what we're proposing today. Um, Abby, you did a great job of kind of walking through a lot of the pieces that um, we would normally like to, uh, that I was thinking about emphasizing, but I'll um, take this opportunity to add um, additional pieces to that. Um, for the, um, for the pieces that are down on the block, I think uh, some of you may have seen that a lot of the historic facade um, preservation work is ongoing. And um, uh, we have uh, four of those uh, pieces that are, or four of the buildings that are actually um, currently completed. Uh, and then we have uh, additional uh, eight or so more that are continuing. And the building that's up here, the Sussex building uh, is sort of next in line for, um, uh, for the, historic pieces to be restored. Just as I'm talking through each of these, uh, again, there was a good introduction at the beginning, but just to note at the lower corner of each of these drawings, uh, there's a little site plan to give everybody a, a view of where we're talking on the block. So the Sussex building here is mid block on the city side. So uh, I think one of the pieces that I wanted to highlight here as part of the conversation about the facade restoration is that these um, areas that are above the first floor across each of these buildings, the masonry components, the cornices, the windows, um, those uh, are all representative of sort of the historic components that uh, the facade restoration is focused on. And these lower floor areas have had a variety of different um, interventions along the way from uh, what you see in the lower left from the 1960s to what you see in the center photo as, as we see today. Um, and so the portion of this facade that was part of the demolition proposal is that lower entry that, um, that was mentioned uh, in the introduction for us. So if we go to the next slide, um, uh, then I won't spend a lot of time on this because I think um, the introduction did a good job of that, but this is just highlighting that entry door component that we're recommending to be removed. And we'll see again later uh, in the proposal um, presentation that it's intended to be um, uh, replaced by matching storefront um, to the what's adjacent to it. Uh, again, here on the roof, um, we understand from our uh, structural evaluation that the roof uh, is in need of some repair. And so that's the nature of why we're looking to replace this roof. Um, I don't know that I have additional that I have to add to, again, what was what was brought up originally. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, here too, with the Kettle Arcade, um, uh, the portion of the facade that we're talking about specifically for removal that we're recommending be removed are the lower steel and glass uh, and signage elements that exist uh, there in the center photo uh, at the bottom. Um, and again, these lower facade areas have gone through a variety of iterations throughout their history. And we are um, recommending uh, to open that back up and create a strong connection back to the Bull and Bear Courtyard. Again, acknowledging that um, the upper portion of the facade is intended to be fully um, restored as part of our larger project. So we can go to the next slide. Um, this is really just uh, identifying the areas um, of the facade that we want to remove and some documentation from uh, when those portions of the building were actually constructed, uh, those steel and glass signage elements having been introduced in, in a 1988 renovation of this uh, building. So we go to the next. Um, there's, uh, this exists both on the Larimer Street facade and also on the rear facade, the rear facade of the Kettle building facing the courtyard, uh, the Bull and Bear courtyard, 
and we're we're uh, proposing removal of both sides um, simultaneously. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, in addition to that, um, the interior of the space was again added in that 1988 renovation, and we're proposing removal of each of those finishes. And again, when we get to the um, proposal presentation, we can talk about what would replace those finishes. Uh, and then uh, lastly, um, again, is the, this is the Burger Building. This is immediately adjacent to the Sussex Building, um, as was discussed earlier. And this facade would be completely um, restored as part of the larger project. Uh, there are some existing uh, elements that live on the sides of the building, like um, uh, exposed ductwork and things like that, that we are planning to remove as part of this um, a part of this process. Uh, and then if we go to the next slide, um, it um, this this really uh, shows a little more detail of what we're talking about on the rear of the Burger Building. So in addition to the items that were introduced um, uh, by Abigail in the beginning, um, part of the renovation of these projects will include new stair and elevator access to multiple floors, which makes the exposed uh, uh, egress elements that you see in the right-hand uh, photograph um, unnecessary. And so we're proposing to remove those uh, as well as the um, lower uh, wood and glass facade elements on the rear of the, of the facade, and then addition the, the mansard style roof screen that you see at the top. So maybe if we go to the next one, there's a, another view of what that um, roof screen is. There had been mechanical units behind that um, that are no longer there actually, and this is a remnant of that um, that uses a mechanical screen. And so uh, our proposal is to remove uh, that roof screen as well. And then um, lastly, um, to reiterate on this rooftop, uh, this roof removal uh, is proposed to accommodate uh, an addition. Um, that addition is a, is a office focused amenity and would be um, uh, set back from the facade and again, um, compliant with all the aspects of a, of a rooftop addition. Um, and again, to reiterate that the perimeter walls, all of the historic features of the perimeter masonry are intended to be restored um, as they are. So that was, uh, that was what I wanted to be able to provide in addition. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you for your time. All right, are there any questions commissioners have for the applicant regarding just the demolition is what we're looking at now. We'll look at um, design review application later. Yeah, Gary. Um, my question has to do with the painting that's on the barrel vault in the Kettle Arcade. Is there um, any significance to that? Not necessarily historic, because I know it's rather new, but is there any uh, plan to uh, document or preserve uh, that work in any particular way? Uh, the, the plan for that um, moving forward was to remove it from this portion of the, of the block. Um, but if there were um, interest in trying to you know, salvage that piece and find a new home for it, I think that's something that um, would be would be reasonable, but there's no plan to reincorporate it into uh, the overall block at this point. That that mural was part of the 1988 uh, renovation of this space, um, as with the rest of the interior components of that of that space. Any other questions for the applicant? Doesn't look like it. All right. Thanks for your time. Um, at this time, we'll open it up for public comments. So if there's anyone on the line who would like to provide a comment, uh, please use the hand raise button at the bottom of your screen if you're joining us by computer or dial star nine if you're joining by phone. Yep, sorry. Uh, we have Suzanne who is back. Um, so you, Suzanne, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Let me get the timer already we got the three minute timer up all right suzanne you're welcome to unmute yourself it should be at the bottom of your screen somewhere there you go 
Hi. Uh, yes, I, I'm glad to be back. I live at 1551 Larimer Street, which is the 31 story high rise directly across from Larimer Square. Um, we use Larimer Square all the time. We dine there all the time. And what's happened so far looks really lovely. The facade changes and, and upgrades, et cetera. We do look down on the rooftops because we're on a high floor. So we will see whatever happens down there. Um, so just wanted to make sure, and I think the historic people on the call will look at, make sure this happens, that it goes no higher than whatever the historic ordinance calls for. Um, secondly, that there's no um, music venue <laughs> planned for those rooftops. And finally, a question about uh, duration of demolition and where the large construction equipment will be located. We are currently, of course, in the middle of the 16th Street reconstruction. We have garage doors on Larimer and on 15th and the construction equipment and location is important to us. So if you could answer that and duration of, of the demolition reconstruction project. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. And maybe um, since we are hearing from the applicant in the next round and the next hearing as well, maybe they can address some of those questions because I don't think we can answer those. <laughs> Um, but not at this time, Lee, I'm sorry, we'll have to wait. Yep, absolutely. Um, all right, so Dana, you are, oh, um, one more question for you, Suzanne. We didn't get your last name and we need that for the record. Last name is Hefty, H-E-F as in Frank, T-Y. Great, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Um, okay, so Dana, you are up. You are welcome to, you're unmuted. Great. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. Um, I've been trying to talk to a good many people about these changes that have been made and overall I'm thinking that they are um, quite um, favorable to Larimer Square and to all the neighbors. However, um, I think there is a concern, a running concern, that maybe some of the changes are being made in order to introduce um, places that will be um, liquor licensed with new bars and um, and there's a very strong sense in the lower downtown area and around Larimer Square that um, that kind of use is not conducive to a healthy lifestyle because there have been unfortunate shootings and some murders um, recently in that area. So I've been assured that none of these changes that we're being discussed today will lead to um, more bars. Thank you. Thanks and, for your comment. And also, Dana, I know that we know you're Dana Crawford, but um, could you <laughs> share, we need for the record, your name and address. Well, hi, my name is Dana Crawford, and um, I live at uh, 2000 Little Raven Street in um, the Platte Valley area. Great, thank you very much. Um, and Miss Suzanne, um, her last name wasn't showing on the screen, so that's why we didn't catch her last name previously. All right, great. Um, I don't see anyone else with their hands raised. Uh, if anyone else would like to speak on this, on the demolition aspect, please feel free. Raise your hand. Okay. All right. Um, great. Well, thank you. Those are great comments. Uh, like I said, unfortunately, I think those are more about the use and construction um, schedule and uh, logistics. So uh, the we will hear from the applicant again. And um, at that time, maybe he can uh, answer those questions for you. So thanks so much for your feedback. All right. Um, unless, Jen, is it possible to have the applicant address that now? Or... Is that out of? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Adam, Adam, could could you answer that question for us? Adam, it looks like you're muted. Huh, I can't hear you. Sounds like we're having some audio issues. 
Yeah. Um, I think it's probably, it, typically we have people who, um, when those questions come up, they, they come up, um, they're addressed by the applicant. Um, if, well, I don't, I don't actually know. It, it's been a long time since um, we've had public commenters who've asked those qu questions of the applicant. Yeah, I think that you as the chair can make that determination since they had two minutes left in their gotcha. presentation okay. time, two minutes and some change. Thanks, Brittany. Then maybe let's go ahead and address it at this time. Um, I don't think that that will influence the decision of the demolition review, but I just um, thought it might help uh, the public to hear those responses. So it looks like you're unmuted. So if you could address those questions um, specifically about um, whether there'd be any music venues on the rooftops, yep. uh, demolition construction equipment, where would that go, duration of construction schedule, and then the concern of uh, these modifications leading to more liquor licenses on the block. Yeah, um, and so the, the two that relate directly to the construction activities, that will be part of a process where we um, are collaborating with the contractor who would actually perform this work. And so the logistics of where that would be um, located and where those construction activities would occur is, is yet to be determined and we'll do uh, hand in hand with, with whoever the contractor is for that. So um, I think that's something that, that it could be, could be followed up on. Um, with regard to the um, schedule, that's sort of in the same uh, category, right? The, the overall duration um, is determinant on some of that coordination with the contractors. Uh, in terms of the music venue question, the additions are intended solely to be used for um, uh, office function, that these are expansions of office areas uh, and that there's no um, intent or, or even support uh, for that kind of function for there to be, you know, there are, there's no plan for kitchens and things like that to be on these upper levels that could support uh, a, a function that was beyond the office that is being planned. Um, I did have one other question written down and that had to do that uh, no higher than what was allowed. Um, and that is something that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in the presentation, but the, the plan is that this these rooftop additions meets all of meet all the requirements of um, the the heights and visibility from the street and and all of those aspects to um, maintain the character of the of the block as a historic item. Did I forget a question? Great, and I yeah, and we will talk about that more in the design review application. Uh, the, I think the other question was Dana Crawford's um, question about liquor licenses and the concern mm. of safety and security given recent events. And I, I think with regard to the proposals that we're talking about here, I can speak to those and that those are intended to be, like the rooftop areas are intended to be um, uh, geared toward the office functions. Uh, in terms of how the rest of the block uh, leases, that's, that's not something um, that I would be prepared to necessarily talk about in this, but I do understand uh, Dana's comment. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. Thank you everyone for your comments. And um, now that we've heard uh, from everyone, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and we'll go ahead and move into deliberation. So commissioners, upon reviewing the application uh, and hearing everything today, how did you feel this meets the guidelines? Again, just the demolition portion. Um, Kelly, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, I think the staff report summed it up very nicely. I think um, the proposed demolition is either for um, non-visible um, elements to the historic buildings that um, you know removal of them does not affect the historic character or removing um, non-historic features that were put in um, after the period of significance. And so I uh, support the application for demolition. Thanks, Erica. 
I would agree with that as well. I think uh, Abby did a great job uh, summarizing. I know it's a complicated project and I, I think as far as the demolition is concerned, it, um, especially having that structural letter indicating uh, the need for replacing that roof, that also um, I think made a lot of sense. And yeah, I'd also support. I can count my support and also uh, I've been a Larimer Square fan uh, for as long as I've lived in Denver, I think, which is pretty long and um, a flat roof behind a parapet that uh, isn't in, in good shape. I think part of Larimer Square's uh, whole charm is that it morphs gently and continually to uh, retain its character as well as its utility in day-to-day in -day modern life. So yeah, by all means, let's see a, a follow-up plan, but I don't have any problem with demolition. Great. Anything to add, Gary or Larry? I love saying your names back to back. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, you know, I, I think I have to support this, although I do have a concern about how often a historic property can be changed. A, 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 you know, understanding that the changes occur to the most recent uh, adaptations and that the original historic fabric remains. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes what happens in the recent past becomes part of the building's history as well. And, uh, you know, this particular demolition plan, and I'm talking particularly about the Kettle Arcade, and I know there's some serious um, structural and condition issues with it, but I'm concerned about the loss of that barrel vault and the artwork um, only because it was you know, important enough to do it one time. It's kind of attractive. It does uh, kind of play on uh, the history of Colorado, its mining history, its uh, interactions with Native Americans and so forth. And uh, just to kind of wipe it out um, as uh, the need to kind of open up the street to the new courtyard function um, seems a, a bit extreme to me. Um, uh, although I don't know that given the uh, way the guidelines are uh, apply, I'm not sure I can object only to uh, voice my concern um, that, you know, as historic properties evolve over time, the um, past attempts to preserve them and make them functional in their own age, at some point becomes important as well. And uh, some of this work seems to ignore that. Um, that's all I had to say. Thanks, Gary. Um, I understand what you're saying. Uh, it, I am looking and it looks like the uh, designation indicates the period of significance to be up to and including 1915. So those kettle building, I mean, I, I know you're aware of this, but the kettle building arcade or kettle arcade is, uh, those modifications were in 1988. And so, yeah. I, I think what I'd like to add to that is that there, there are occasions when the designation for a property or a district probably needs to be updated so that the period of significance extends longer. And that's a that's a question for architects, but I think that's something that um, some of our districts uh, could benefit from. Thanks. So yeah, I'll, I'll jump in with my uh, thoughts. I I agree generally with um, you know the lack of concern about the roof and demolishing the roof and its impact. Um, and I do think that just to yeah, echo Gary, I think that kind of popped up in my head as well about the, the Kettle Arcade, but being not part of the uh, period of significance, it's, it's not really in our purview. And yeah, another discussion for another day. So I'll support the motion. Thanks, Larry. All right, um, would someone like to make a motion? Uh, 
I'll take the shot. Go ahead. George, all you. Okay. Madam Chair, I move to conditionally approve application number 2022 LM demo 348 for the demolition of 1410 to 1440. Larimer Street as per design guidelines 2.55 and 2.57, character defining features for the Larimer Square Historic District, presented testimony and submitted documentation and information provided in the staff report with the condition that a replacement plan be approved prior to the demolition. Thank you, George. Do we have a second? All second. Thanks, Larry. All right, if there's no further discussion on the motion, I'll call for the vote. George. Aye. Let's see, Gary. Aye. Larry. Aye. Erica. Aye. And Kelly. Aye. All right, so we have a unanimous vote and the motion passes. So the demolition um, is conditionally approved. All right, so we have one more public hearing today. and. Oops, we seem to have lost Kelly. We need to wait. Can I go ahead? No, we need you to, we need, uh, we need her to come back. <laughs> She's okay. the chair. So there she is. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. So you just oh, said, you just say, said the address and that's all. So okay. start again. Okay. Um, start over. Yes. Okay, sorry, so <laughs> I don't know what just happened, but thank you. Um, all right, our next public hearing is for 2022-LM Demo-349 at 1413 through 1427 Larimer Street. Um, so I will open the public hearing. Okay, so I here we have a similar project to our last demo review in that it is a roof demolition that is triggering the public hearing. And then there will also be some associated demolition um, that's also part of the project that is for non-historic features. So those on their own wouldn't trigger a public hearing, but since they're part of the demo, we're reviewing all of the demolition as part of this. So uh, the Roof demolition here is at the Lincoln building that you see there on the left. So um, the more than 40% or in this case, the entire roof structure of the Lincoln building is being proposed for demolition um, to accommodate a new rooftop addition. And then additionally, there is proposed demolition of non-historic features, including the rear alley walls of the Condon and Lincoln buildings and the central storefront and steps at the Congdon facade. Okay, so there you have the roof of the Lincoln Building. Um, so it's proposed for demolition for a new rooftop addition. Um, the roof of the Lincoln Building is flat and does not have really any distinguishing historic features beyond its form. Um, and even that has been altered. You can see there in the middle, there has been a large skylight installed that extends across the roof. So there has been quite a bit of alteration here kind of to the roof form with the installation of that skylight. You can see they here that include with that skylight some alteration um, to the parapet walls as well. So the parapet walls will be, if later additions removed, the original parapet walls will be restored and then that roof structure will be removed. And you can tell it also changed some with some rear additions and other, there's a lot of stuff that went over here and a kind of a lot of modifications that have been made to that Lincoln roof over time. Um, so the roof and material has been replaced numerous times and the rooftop has been altered with the installation of skylights and various mechanical equipment. Uh, then also the rear facade of the Lincoln building is being proposed for demolition. Um, as you can tell then also some alterations to the window openings, including at the moment there's some odd things going on with alterations that have been made uh, to interior 
floor levels. So that's kind of a lot of the goal of this is to kind of some clean up some modifications that have been made over time. Um, so that's the proposal then to kind of alter those windows, uh, the window openings in that rear wall in order to coincide with uh, cleaning up some floor to ceiling levels inside. Uh, but this rear facade is entirely non-historic. Um, so this is a non-historic feature that is being proposed for demolition. Uh, then at the front of the Congdon building, um, there's also proposed for demolition, the central storefront. So the central storefront is also a later addition, it was constructed, um, it's a recessed storefront that has two staircases and kind of stairs leading down to a central stair there, um, designed as a walkway through the building. So you kind of go through, you enter here, go downstairs, and then the stairs lead you out at the rear and then across the alley to a parking garage. Um, so the applicant is proposing to remove this configuration where you kind of move through the building at the basement level and restore instead having street level access here. So the proposal is to remove the staircases, put in a floor there, um, and then you know, be able to enter. So proposal to but this is also entirely a non-historic after the period of significance feature that is being proposed for demolition. And then also the rear facade of the Condon is being proposed for demolition. This is another um, part of the alterations that occurred um, over time. And so this is an entirely non-historic, the brick is not historic, window openings, um, with all the trim um, are all non-historic. So this is also proposed uh, to be demolished. So staff is proposing approval with the condition that a replacement plan be approved prior to any demolition um, beginning. Um, so staff is recommending this based on the fact that due to alterations over time, the roof of the Lincoln Building has limited historic character integrity. Demolition of the roof will not impact the historic character of the building. The historic cornice and parapet walls will be retained and restored. And other demolition is being limited to non-historic features. Um, constructed outside of the period of significance of the Larimer Square District. Um, no historic features on Larimer Square will be impacted and no significant character defining features will be impacted. Thank you, Abby. Are there any questions for staff? Nope. All right, let's uh, get the applicant back. And when you're ready, go ahead and unmute yourself, as you know. Um, well, actually, I think you don't need to go ahead and say your name and address since we just heard from you. <laughs> uh, so unless there are any additional or new speakers, um, you can go ahead and get started. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, it always takes a minute when I go from uh, audience to presenter to get everything set back up again, uh, but I'm ready to start. Um, uh, I'm going to do this in the reverse order of what you just heard uh, and talk first about the Congdon building. But before I did that, I did want to take an opportunity to, um, because these two buildings, the Lincoln and the Congdon building, which you see in this plan here with the red uh, box around it, um, there's, there's uh, some larger intention behind what we're attempting to do here. And I just wanted to highlight that as part of this. Um, these uh, general project goals are things that we've been trying to infuse throughout the project. Um, and I wanna focus quickly on this item number two and the importance of that um, for Larimer Square. And, and, and that is this idea that the connection from the parking garage on Market Street to Larimer Square um, is an important connector. And the current connection through the walkway that um, was presented earlier, um, is through the basement level and doesn't provide um, ADA access and is um, not a, uh, an overly welcoming space to, to go through. And as you all know, the square uh, has been closed to vehicular traffic for a few years now. And so without having auto access on that square, the connection to the parking garage has that much more 
uh, importance. And so part of what we're proposing here is to enhance that sequence to get um, between those two spaces. So if we go to the next slide. Um, I'll try not to um, reiterate all, uh, all the pieces of the previous one. Um, but again, looking at the Congdon building in terms of how it has changed uh, over time, uh, the upper levels of the, of the facade being um, the pieces that have retained more intact over the years and where the historic significance lies and those first floor areas being modified at different points along the way. Um, this is just a sample timeline of, of how that facade has changed over time. Uh, and as was indicated um, previously in the lower left photo uh, here, um, there's an orange canopy zone. That's the, that's the walkway. That's the current connection from Larimer to the, through the basement to the parking garage. And so you, you, know, you hit the facade and you go down a set of stairs immediately. And what, we're, what we'd like to do, what we're proposing is that you'd be able to enter the building at grade and be able to then access the circulation that can get you to um, new stairs and elevators that can connect you to the parking garage. So go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, this is the slide that you had just been um, looking at, but uh, the intention here is that this element of the facade, because the stairs drop down at the when you when you get to the building face, this area is set back about 12 feet from the uh, from the facade plane, and um, the future proposal will recommend an, an operable component that replaces what we're looking to remove here on the uh, on the storefront. So, yeah, it, it, this is just really looking at the at the rear and maybe go to the next slide. The, the importance of of this and the demolition of this rear facade is to um, it will be it, the proposal is to replace it with a new uh, brick facade, but one that has openings that correlate to the functions that are being planned to the in, interior. And so I just wanted to pinpoint that. So if we go to the next slide, um, uh, again, back to the Lincoln building, um, as uh, I've been saying on each of these, right, the facades have gone through a variety of iterations. And, and actually um, in, on this one, you can see from the photo on the left from the 1960s, a lot of the um, facial uh, character, like the window eyebrows and the cornices and those things had all been removed at one point. What you see there today is what we're intending to restore um, and preserve that facade in terms of what uh, is currently um, kind of expected as that as that as that frontage. So if you go to the the next slide, this is a section of the Lincoln Building um, to give a little bit more um, clarity to what um, was being shown as far as. Um, what's new and, and what's old on the it's a hard drawing to read but on the right hand side of the drawing there's a gray hatched area that's the Larimer Street facade all of the floor plates the roof and the rear of this building were removed and replaced in in and around the late 70s these drawings are from 1975 and and the intention as the discussion on the alley facade was talking about the height of the windows the interior was created as a split level design such that you would uh, enter halfway into the building and then go up half a set of stairs and, and keep kind of going back and forth in this. And, and the end result of what our proposal is, is to go back to the singular floor plate um, of what would have been um, more traditionally aligned and remove the split level uh, idea from that. So if we go to the last page, um, uh, again, this is just sort of reiterating as part of uh, that interior remodel in the 70s, the central skylight um, was installed, and that's where the shift in the floor planes happened. And, and the existing masonry walls to either side of the building uh, have combinations of CMU and other patchwork to make the flanking sides of that skylight work. And our goal is to remove all of those non-brick masonry pieces, um, preserve the elements that remain that are the historic multi-wide brick walls, um, uh, and, and then again, work toward the proposal for the rooftop uh, addition that would, that would replace this. 
Um, I think that's the last in, in these slides. Thank you again for an opportunity to provide a little more conversation about this proposal. All right, thanks. Are there any questions for the applicant? All right, looks like it was all clear. Thanks for your time. Okay, um, is there anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment? Now's the time to do so. Please use the hand raise button at this time. See, we have uh, David has um, raised his hand. So David, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Please start with your name and address for the record. You have up to three minutes. Hi, my name is David Preble. My address is 270 Elm Street, Denver. Um, I'm the owner of Victoriana Antique Jewelry in Larimer Square. We've been in business down here since 1977. My wife and I bought it in 84 from Dana. <clears throat> so I've been through all four owners of Larimer Square, from Dana to the Han Company, to Jeff Hermanson, and now through Asana Partners. Um, and in all these dealings, Everybody except for the current owners has been, been very forthright and upright with what they present to us. I have got the feeling from Asana Partners that they are just going to give you just enough each time to get what they have for their master plan. They've talked about an addition on Larimer on top of Lincoln Hall, but they haven't defined it yet. And I think what's going to happen is this is going to end up like a Hollywood set. They're saving the body and killing the soul. They're gonna have great facades and then there'll be nothing left that's a local individualized experience for people. It's going to be all chain restaurants and national tenants. And you're going to lose the complete flavor of Larimer Square by approving all these non-historic changes. Anyway, that's my two cents. Thank you. Um, I realize that since the staff has already recommended things that this is probably just an exercise in futility, but thank you for listening to me. Thanks for your comment, David. Are there any other public yep. comments? Uh, yep, Dana Crawford has raised your hand. Dana, you're welcome to unmute. I'm back again. Um, I think that um, there are, are so many people who have discussed with me their attachment to Larimer Square as a very important part of Denver, Denver per se, not of um, European boutiques or um, that sort of thing. But I want once again to stress that if, if a lot of these changes mean uh, is preparation for uh, more bars and restaurants, uh, that's a big mistake. And furthermore, um, there are some things that need to be done that would be very, very helpful to Asana in terms of tax credits, which I would be happy to talk to somebody about and um, see if we can not take advantage of um, opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, just meeting. Uh, no, no other hands raised at this time. Okay. All right. Um, thank you so much. So seeing as there are no other public comments, um, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and commission will move into deliberation. All right. Um, what did the commissioners think about this application? I, I would just maybe like to interject after hearing the public comments, um, because I think that they're very thoughtful and real concerns. So I appreciate them voicing it at, at this hearing. I mean, now's the time to do it. I. Um, a little bit struggle because use is not in our purview. And so um, it's, it's difficult um, to hear the concern and I think they're completely valid. And um, what we heard from the applicant is that they don't have information 
about you know future tenants. Um, at least that's what we heard in the in the last uh, conversation we had. So I just wanted to express that you know I, I think those are valid concerns. Unfortunately, I personally don't see how I can take that into consideration with the demolition review since we're really looking at whether the demolition meets our guidelines um, and, and the replacement plan, if demo is approved, meets the guidelines. Um, and use is really more of a zoning issue unless, Jen, um, you have anything to add to that. I just, you know, yeah, I correct. wanted to mention it. Yeah, okay. use is all, is all um, under the purview of zoning. So if it meets the zoning code for use, then, then um, then the use would be allowed. Um, if there were new liquor licenses, they'd have to get a, a license from excise and licenses. And uh, there are a lot of steps to that. So, mm -hmm. um, but they are not a landmark. Our, the purview of the commission is um, to focus on the design guidelines and the ordinance. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say that so um, that the public knew, you know, uh, unfortunately, legally we can't take that into consideration so we are going to look at these based on the landmark preservation guidelines and and how that applies to this application so with that said um commissioners are there any um thoughts on this gary yeah well i mean the, the comment that was made by um Mr. Preble um, kind of crystallized for me the concerns I have um, more for this side of the street than the other. And that is um, when all is said and done, uh, all is all that we have saved a facade. Um, you know, one of the things that is attractive about Larimer Square and has been since uh, I first visited it. 45 years ago was the kind of, um, I'm gonna use the word funky, but that's not really correct. The, the fact that it was, uh, the way the, the new uses adapted into the existing building kept more than just the character of the building. There was a sense of uh, kind of uh, uniqueness in each of those original uh, businesses and you know the um, the concern I'd have is that this is going to be come a modern shopping facility with historic facades and that becomes possible when we allow too much demolition to the existing buildings. I mean I, I was fond of the way the Lincoln building was originally renovated um, with with you know, that interior space and the skylight. There was a restaurant in there many, many years ago that was a very pleasant experience. Um, and it's just that you know, allowing for almost a complete gut of the Lincoln building is a concern. And while the guidelines specifically don't prevent it, the standards for rehabilitation might in terms of you know, the standard about compatible new use. And um, you know how how much of the existing fabric, whether it's from the 1890s or the 1910s or the 1970s, how much of that existing fabric is important to save in order to retain the character in whole, not just a facade, not just an experience from the street, but sort of an experience of what these buildings might have been like when they were originally built. So I have some concerns and I'm, I haven't really decided yet whether I'm gonna support um, the motion or not. I'd like to hear from other people about this and maybe Erica, since you're, this is your field of expertise, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I'm wondering what you think. Well, um, Gary, I, I really appreciate your, your thoughtful <laughs> kind of talking through um, what gives you pause about these. Um, I guess what strikes me in hearing you speak, which all of the points you make, I, I don't disagree with, 
but I feel like it points to maybe the limitations of historic preservation in the way it makes a city. <laughs> um, and because it is, you know, we heard this public comment of body versus soul of these buildings. And I think really, if, if we're talking about, without trying to get too deep into that metaphor, um, really our purview is the body and, and how well that contains the soul or the use or how that use responds to what the community wants to see is not the tool, historic preservation isn't um, on its own, is not the tool to um, address those concerns. And, and so I, again, I um, appreciate all that you've said and I agree with it, but I'm not sure that within our purview of the commission um, that we can, um, can say, that uh, you know they don't meet the guidelines when we're talking about something that um, is removing non-historic features. Um, as I understand it, you know the, the skylight. I I did wonder at um, about the skylight as far as what did that space look like when it was um, in use, but it it is not a historic feature of the building as defined by. Um, the period of significance for Larimer Square. Um, I guess I'll just add to that, you know, the question of should the period of significance be um, uh, expanded, um, it I think is a legitimate question that is not part of this hearing today, um, is also, um, you know, that needs to be kind of part of a greater community discussion as well. The um, preservation of Larimer Square is arguably a significant event in Denver's history, and you know the the preservation of it was part of a new wave of development and Denver understanding its place, um, you know, valuing its own history. But again, that's beyond the scope of what we have before us today. And so I um, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I I just think that what we have before us today, I think clearly meet the guidelines that we have for us and that these other concerns um, should continue to be brought up by the community members who have them um, along the way of all these other steps of how do we, we as a city, as a community say what's important to us and, and what do we want to see happen with these um, buildings, which of course are also private property. So um, that's, those are my thoughts. Well, I, I can certainly feel what, what Gary is saying also, uh, being, you know, Habitat of Larimer Square. Oh, golly, you know, there's a very thin line between unique and kitsch and, uh, I, for one, appreciated the creaky wooden floors and the uh, exposed wrought iron and, and modern sort of, or current sort of services and goods being offered in that, in that environment. But uh, I, I do miss the flick and I do miss uh, uh, the Raskeller. But on the, on the other hand, I, I think, you know, Erica hits it very closely that, 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 you know, maybe we want to think about in the future extending what the period of significance is, if they are significant uh, experiences for all of us. But right now, facades are really our, our principal and guideline uh, uh, concerns. Uh, the, the feeling a Larimer Square gave you during their oh Christmas times during the seventies or something like that is is uh, unique and it may or may not be recoverable. But uh, again, it, our purview I have to stick with Eric. Our, our purview is is uh, facades and historic 
you know, significance that the building was put up in a certain year and it looked like this pretty much in its certain creation. Um, and the uses inside are, you know, yes, they are private properties and they have to be you know, allowed to do that. But uh, so far, I haven't seen anything that really violates uh, the bridging of the two. So of, of the, uh, the modern and, and the feeling you would get when you walk down Larimer Street. So I, I think, I, again, and I also have the out of, of seeing the uh, uh, the actual design review, so at the moment I would say I could support the demolition because it's it's hinged on what else are they going to do with it. So I think I, I I'm I'm cautiously in support. Um, I agree with what's been said, and I I hear you, Gary. I think Erica, you kind of summed up how I feel about it, which is I just think based on our purview, it does meet the guidelines. So um, I would be in, in support of um, the app, approving the application conditionally based on the staff recommendation. Um, the only thing I'd add is I know Dana Crawford mentioned in her comment that she wishes the owners would consider tax credits and um, tax, if they were to pursue tax credits, this would be a different discussion, the demolition, you know, uh, because what the, what our landmark purview is over is just the exterior, but um, the tax credits would mean that both the exterior and interior would need to meet the Secretary of Interior standards. Um, so I, I did just want to voice that, um, you know, in re I'm reviewing this based on what we have in front of us today, which is that they're not pursuing tax credits and we're just reviewing the demolition against our landmark guidelines. So for that reason, I'd be in support of the application. I'd also like to chime in that the tax credits for commercial would be managed by the state, so you wouldn't even be reviewing them. Gotcha. Thanks, Jen. But that is something for the owner to be aware of that um, just because we approve something, if they're going to pursue funding separately, um, that is a red flag to be aware of that we're not saying that they would be eligible based That's on us. That's great. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think I agree in general, uh, particularly with uh, Erica's commentary. And I want to also just put out there that, um, you know, as, as much as I totally do understand that um, concern about the, the soul of Larimer Square, looking at the, you know, building sections of both the Lincoln and the Congdon buildings, as well as things like the sunken courtyard in the bull and bear kind of um, part across the street, there clearly were some major ADA things that weren't considered in a lot of the original um, revitalization of Larimer Square. And so I, you know, just as a friendly comment, I want to commend the um, designers for taking this opportunity to make this a more accessible and inclusive space. And so I do think that there's a public benefit to be considered in that. That's a great point, Larry. All right, um, I think we've heard from everyone. So uh, for the sake of time, we do have a long agenda. Does someone want to make a motion? I, I can make the motion. Thank you, Erica. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to conditionally approve application number 2022-LM demo-3449. That's 349, sorry. Uh, for the demolition at 1413 to 1427 Larimer Street, as per design guidelines 2.55 and 2.57, character-defining features for the Larimer Square Historic District, presented testimony, 
submitted documentation and information provided in the staff report with the condition that a replacement plan be approved prior to demolition. Thanks, Erica. Do we have a second? I'll second. A second. Thank you, Larry. Right, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, if there's no further discussion on the motion, I will call for the vote. George. Aye. Gary. Aye. Larry. Aye. Erica. Aye. Kelly. Aye. All right, the motion passes, so uh, the demolition is conditionally approved. Um, okay, so that ends our public hearings today. We're going to move forward with the design review projects um, on today's agenda. So I'll go ahead and announce, similarly to the hearing process, I'll announce the project. Staff will introduce the application and provide their recommendation. Um, then we'll hear from the applicant who will have 10 minutes to present. Um, and then we'll open it up for public comments. Uh, the only difference here is that public comments for design review projects are two minutes long, um, after which we'll move into deliberation and the commission will vote. Um, oh, and we don't need to move Graham back yet because we've got the same applicant. So, uh, all right. Our first design review project for review today is the same applicant we were just speaking with. It's project number 2022-COA-308. And this is for the 1410 through 1440 Larimer Street buildings. Okay, thanks. Okay, so here you have the same slide that you saw earlier. I think it's just a good one to set the stage to give an idea of kind of all the complexity and the interrelated parts here um, in the two applications so you can have an idea of how things are fitting together. Um, so in December 2020, Asana Partners um, purchased Larimer Square. Um, the new owners have been working with Landmark staff as well as other city departments in developing their plans for the block. Um, during the pandemic, Larimer Square was closed to traffic and the owners are currently working with the city to establish the block as a pedestrian street permanently. As part of that, the applicant is also reevaluating kind of pedestrian flow through Larimer Square and looking for ways to improve access from Larimer Square parking garage to the north onto Larimer Square and then increase use of the courtyard areas that are to the south. Um, so a lot of what you're looking at kind of relates to those you know, associated goals along with just overall um, doing some much needed you know, restoration and maintenance um, on Larimer Square. They are proposing a new rooftop addition at the Burger Building and several alterations from the 1970s and 1980s will be removed. A lot of these relate to previous owners when this was kind of, you know, converted into a version of a shopping mall previously when this what you know did have at one time very was a shopping mall with various national tenants that then kind of moved to more local tenants has moved, you know, various iterations through the years. But a lot of these were kind of done, um, you know, with the, you know, with various conversions um, as uses have changed over time. Um, so some of the elements that are proposed for removal, uh, the metal decorative entry framing at the Kettle Arcade, along with the wall cladding and display windows, um, and then also the sunken courtyard that is at the Bull and Bear. Uh, the replacement designs in these areas will either be simplified versions of historic forms or modern interpretations of historic forms. Let's see if I can get the PowerPoint. Ah, there it goes. Okay, so I thought it might just be helpful to start with this. Look at the floor plan here as we kind of move through. So here's the existing site plan on the left, the proposed on the right. Um, so the work proposed here as part of this application. Um, so we really debated the best way to handle these applications. We did combine them together, work with the applicant to combine them together for each side of the block, just because there were so many bits and pieces that were interrelated. That it was all about how the buildings related to each other, that it just became really hard to try to divide them into individual applications because they're so interrelated. And the scope of work and construction moving forward is proposed to be interrelated. So just a little explanation of why you've got these really large application projects. 
Uh, so the proposed work here includes facade and window restoration um, and some win replacement of non-historic windows. Um, historic window evaluations have been conducted for all buildings by Philip Barlow of Barlow Cultural Resource Consulting and recommend recommendations for window uh, repair and replacement um, have been made based on that condition assessment. Um, we kind of look at the buildings here. Um, kind of moving across, we have the Wooten building. Um, there though, will be some replacement of non-historic windows and doors, um, but a door that's gonna go into a window opening. Then on the kettle, we have the alterations to the kettle arcade that were mentioned during the demo version, sorry, demo uh, review. Then we have the next to that, the Sussex building, um, where there will be some window and door alterations. Then we have the Burger building, where there will be the new rooftop addition, um, as well as alterations to the rear courtyard facing facade. Um, and then to the rear, we have courtyard alterations. So kind of reconfiguration of the bull and bear courtyard to remove the sunken area and to make that all a grade. And then also some reconfiguration of the keep courtyard and some of the stairs at the keep courtyard as well. So I'm gonna try to move through this in a somewhat logical order. Uh, I'm gonna start with kind of the facade alterations and I'll move to the bull and bear courtyard then through the Sussex building to the keep um, courtyard and the rooftop addition and the you know, work at that courtyard. So just a little, some overview here. So here you see the proposed alterations at the Kettle Arcade. So there you see the current kind of iteration of the Kettle Arcade on the left that has the metal framing and signage. Then on the right, you have the proposed new Kettle Arcade. Um, the signage you see there has not yet been approved, so no signage is included as part of this application package. That's just kind of conceptual. Um, any signage would need to be removed, reviewed by Landmark in the future um, prior you know, to any installation. Um, so at the Kettle Arcade, they are proposing to remove non-historic metal columns and the spandrel glazing at both ends to remove the non-historic barrel vault ceiling added in the 1980s, um, remove the non-historic wall cladding that has various display windows and doors, and then to also remove the stairs that are currently located in the Kettle Arcade that go down to a basement level, um, that access will be moved inside instead of, yeah. so basically a lot of places that you know, kind of these, a lot of multiple staircases through, um, through is it, that flow through this side of the block will be removed. Um, so they'll, they are proposing to install new brick cladding within the Kettle Arcade, um, install new aluminum clad wood windows and doors, um, and to have new wood spandrel panels that'll be located above the windows and doors. So here, just to give an idea, so here's the proposed both from the front and rear. Um, so the historic storefront at the Kettle building is currently completely gone. Um, the first floor of the Kettle building was converted to an arcade leading from Lammer Street to the Bull and Bear Courtyard as part of the renovations that occurred from the 60s to the 80s. Um, the applicant is not returning to propose. It's not, sorry. The applicant is not proposing to return the first floor of the Kettle building to its original design. Um, we do have guideline 2.41, which states to restore an altered storefront to its original design. In this case, it's somewhat challenging since it's hard to know exactly what the original condition was um, due to the multiple alterations over time. Um, instead of trying to you know, kind of speculate as to what the original design was, instead the applicant is proposing simply to remove the non-historic elements within the arcade um, but to then leave the arcade opening. Um, staff think that this is compatible. 
working with an existing non-historic feature and making it, you know, just kind of simplifying it, making it more compatible with the district by removing non-historic materials and a simplified design. This avoids creating a false sense of history by constructing a conjectural storefront while retaining a feature that helps to tell the story of the evolution of Larimer Square in the mid 20th century. So keeping you know, the fact that it is an arcade does provide an element and a connection that tells that story of the ele you know, evolution then in the mid 20th century of Larimer Square. All right, so here you see that the, the brick that you see here on the left is the brick that is proposed um, for use within the kind of the new cladding within the Kettle Arcade. This is really our only concern with the proposed redesign of the Kettle Arcade. In the application, there's some inconsistency. At some points, the brick is labeled as being red brick. Um, the General Shale bar, Ballpark and others, it's labeled as this brick, which is the General Shale Niagara Mist. Um, which is a mixed palette of bricks. Um, speaking with the applicant, they would like to use this Niagara mist. Staff has some concerns with the variety of colors proposed here. Um, some of that really also some of that, you know, the real contrast between the light and the dark brick and that kind of texture. Um, for simplicity, uh, you know, so that the brick isn't jumping out at you and kind of just blends with the surrounding staff would recommend the selection of a single brick color rather than mixed um, and would recommend a single color brick with a smooth texture that could relate either to the adjacent masonry on the Larimer Street entrance or um, to the masonry that's on the Bull and Bear. So just something that kind of you know, neutral color that kind of, you know, could just, you know, not be an attention grabbing feature um, there within the arcade is the staff recommendation. Uh, the applicant is also proposing new lighting within the arcade. Um, this does include some lighting features that typically are not lighting that we, you know, would see um, with some, you know, some kind of dramatic lighting. Um, however, since this is confined to the courtyard, I'm um, sorry, to the arcade, I will not spill out on the street as at least as is shown here, as long as the light does, is confined to within the arcade, um, staff you know, find it appropriate for this feature um, as long as it is not spilling out onto the street or you know, impacting the facade of the building. So here then we have the Sussex facade. Um, so there is an alteration proposed here for kind of the, um, the storefront that's on the left here. So currently you can see if you look at the center there, currently the drawing shows uh, um, existing and proposed. The, on the left, you see there's currently a door there. They are proposing to replace that door, which is not historic, and just put in a simple storefront window. Um, it will align with the transom and kick plate height of the adjacent. Um, staff finds this is a simple um, alteration that meets guideline uh, 2.13, which is just you know, develop a new design that's a simplified interpretation of a similar feature um, when the original is missing and cannot be documented. So this just seems like a, you know, simple storefront uh, window that is going to align with the adjacent. So then moving back to the courtyards. So here you have images of the existing Bull and Bear courtyard on the left and the proposed on the right. Um, so as talked about, they propose to eliminate the sunken courtyard which is going to become a mechanical area underneath, put in a new floor, um, eliminate the stairs and the multi levels. So it will be an open, you know, kind of plaza courtyard area, all one floor level. Um, and then they are also proposing um, to remove the doors there at the, that go through the Sussex building. Um, that's another alteration, that kind of path, arch pathway through the Sussex was another alteration from 70s and 80s period as kind of the flow was changed. Um, so the idea is to activate the courtyards more and to make it more clear to people that they can go through to the Keep Courtyard, which is now kind of a hidden feature that doesn't, you know, it's kind of, is it 
public? Is it private? So the idea to just remove um, those new non-historic doors and to you know, create an opening through the building um, to the keep courtyard. So you can see here, there's some alterations to window openings. Um, so some of the multi-light non-historic windows that were installed as part of various renovation efforts will be removed and just replaced with simpler, um, simpler uh, window openings. Um, so that's all, I think those are pretty straightforward. There'll also be there, you can see on the left one, a multi-light arched window will be replaced with a door in the same opening. So here you can see the courtyard plan. Um, so there's the sunken courtyard part that will be covered over. Um, and so here's the new configuration proposed for the courtyard. There is also new lighting proposed for the courtyard. Um, so this does include some floodlights, like you know, sconces, sign, you know, sign lights, tree up lights, string lights, pendants. Um, this is more lighting types than would typically be appropriate for a historic building um, and includes the use of up lighting um, and flood lighting, which we do not typically allow, but because these are confined to the rear. Um, in an enclosed courtyard, staff is not as concerned. And previously, the commission has allowed features like this if they are in the backyard. Um, and so we find, you know, for a you know, kind of what's intended to be a restaurant courtyard space um, that, again, as long as these you know, are not going to be visible um, from the facade, um, staff is not overly concerned with the additional lighting proposed here for the courtyard. Okay, so then on to the keep courtyard um, to the rear of the burger building. Um, so here you see the existing configuration on the left. So you can see that the first floor of the burger building there has already been significantly altered with a kind of new storefront system um, put in, though it kind of has some. You know, bits and pieces to it. Um, so they're going to kind of just clean that up a little bit, put in a more simplified um, modern storefront there across the first floor. Um, and then there will be the addition that is proposed for the roof of the burger building. Um, as you can see, this kind of also has a stair down and some other multi-level um, going on. And so that's also going to be infilled. So you'll have a single floor level. Um, and some of the stairs here will be removed and a new service elevator is going to be installed at the courtyard. And then on to the proposed rooftop addition. Um, so here is the new rooftop addition. Um, so guideline 3.12 states design in addition to a historic commercial structure to be clearly differentiated, differentiated from the original structure. Um, so staff find that the design and materials of the rooftop addition here will clearly identify it as new construction uh, while being simple and modern. Uh, the flat roofed addition is contemporary. Um, the addition walls will be a combination of aluminum framed curtain wall and fiber cement panel. Um, the rooftop patio um, will be located in front of the addition. Um, it is not set back from the facade, but uh, guidelines allow this when it can be shielded from view by a parapet wall. In this case, the parapet wall is four foot, ten and a quarter inches, um, which will shield that uh, rooftop patio from view. So here you have a view of the addition for how and other proposed alterations from the keep side. So this is the rear of the burger building looking onto the keep building. Um, so you see the removal on the top of that kind of faux mansard mechanical screen. And that is where you will then see the new addition. Um, and then you can see the kind of alterations there that have gone on at the first floor with new storefronts and then the proposed um, new uh, aluminum frame curtain wall that will go in, that's proposed to go in there on the first floor. 
And then there you have the view from the facade. Um, so the addition, you will not actually be able to see you know, the addition looking straight on, but there's a straight on view. Um, the addition will be set back from the facade, um, 18 feet, 11 inches. Um, and the addition will be 13 feet, eight inches tall. Uh, so there you can see, get a side view to see kind of, yeah, the setback and placement. Um, so some discussion of the materials. So the addition is proposed to be clad, as I said, in an um, aluminum frame curtain wall. Um, so there you see in the lower left, um, that will be the anodized aluminum that is proposed. Um, then above that, you have the fiber cement panel, um, the equitone that is proposed for the wall cladding. Um, and then there is also proposed a nano wall that will be located there um, on the facade of the addition that will you know, kind of be the access point between the addition and uh, the rooftop patio that will be located in front of it. Uh, the trim on the addition will be a composite uh, aluminum rain screen. And the floor cladding there on the patio will be um, a porcelain tile. So here you see uh, views, you know, of showing that the addition will not be visible from straight on. However, it will have some views from an angle. So you can see here at the bottom, um, kind of current side view and the view of the existing, what it will be, um, what would be once constructed. Um, due to the fact that on the opposite side, there's a taller building, it really won't, it's really just gonna have views you know, it's really going to be visible just from this angle. It won't have visibility from the other angle since it's blocked from a top, the taller building on the opposite side. Uh, then just here is the existing keep courtyard and the proposed. So closing in some staircases there and then building a new elevator structure. And the a similar lighting start with string lighting um, will be proposed for the keep cart courtyard. So similar to what is proposed in the bull and bear courtyard. Okay, and that's it. All right, thank you, Abby. Uh, are there any questions for staff? I, yeah. I did have one quick question. Um, when we see landscaping out front um, at the street, both for this and the other um, Larimer Street design review, is that that is not um, within, there are no changes proposed at this time at the street uh, landscaping. Correct. And most of what you, yeah, what you see here is conceptual, but also most of what you see as far as on the street it isn't really in our purview because things that are in the public right of way, kind of the street is more, you know, we're part of the discussions with Dottie and others as far as the street closures. And so some of that will have to work out exactly what purview would be to who exactly would be review, reviewing what might go there. But certainly today, no alterations to any of the site work on the, you know, on Larimer Street are proposed as part of this application today. Great. Any other questions? No. All right. Um, let's go ahead and promote the applicant. Looks like that may have happened already. So um, unmute yourself when you're ready. Please start with your name and address, and you have up to 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you again. Um, hi, this is Lee Starrett, um, 1047 Steel Street in Denver. Um, <clears throat> I uh, won't go too much into detail on some of the, these pieces and maybe a little more detail on the sequence of, of spaces. And so I just wanted to talk um, really briefly about um, how these spaces, uh, like the courtyards, inter interweave with each other and become a critical part of 
the development proposal. So this, uh, you had just seen this um, as far as the facade renovation. So we can move to the next uh, image. <clears throat> we could get, there we go. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's all right. Um, and, and I did want to um, uh, highlight about uh, staff's concern with the brick. Um, we support that um, recommended change, um, but I did want to talk a little bit about that um, sequence. So the addition of that brick um, that's proposed underneath the Kettle Arcade uh, is proposed to be in this gray family, um, really to be in uh, similar proximity, not an exact match, but similar proximity to what the Wooten building uh, has as part of its facade, which you can see on the right hand photo um, and in the right hand side of the <clears throat> of the rendering. And the idea here isn't to try and match it completely, but to um, ground the sides of the building right as the Kettle Arcade spans. Um, and, and I don't know that everybody knows that, but it was built to span between the Sussex building on the right and the Wooten building on the left. So it has no first floor uh, structural components to it. Um, and so as we open up this passage and create this, this connection, this very obvious connection back to the courtyards, we felt like the gray brick grounded uh, the building and gave it um, some good context there. We did look at other colors uh, like some of the reds and those tended to maybe feel like it was floating um, and so we uh, thought this was a good approach, but we do believe that um, uh, a uniform brick color uh, is a is a fine solution, and we would support uh, resubmitting that brick to meet that that requirement. Um, yeah. So this next uh, image is is again going back through the the kettle arcade. You see the arcade on the left, and one of the key pieces to the development. A proposal um, is really this support of the office spaces that occur on the upper levels and and the success of those office spaces can drive the success of of the block to some degree and so interwoven with that is that um, many of these uh, historic structures don't provide for um, uh, elevators that reach all of the levels and um, different um, stair cores that connect through each of those. So one of the proposals here is that as you come through the Kettle Arcade, this opening of the um, breezeway that we're calling it the breeze, the Sussex breezeway there, that gets you access uh, to stairs and elevators that both take you down to the lower level functions and up into the office functions. And at the very back of that rendering, you can see another archway. It's a little hard to read. <clears throat> and that is what leads into the keep courtyard beyond. So um, that's just a critical piece of being able to drive some of the, the access and flow between these spaces is opening up some of the areas. So in, in the next slide, um, this steps back a little bit. And I did just want to touch on this, um, you know, the. It, the part of the overall um, proposal is to increase and upgrade the utility infrastructure that the block has, you know, for the 100 plus years that the block has been um, operating. There have been a variety of utility add-ons and changes and things, and, and unifying that um, has a benefit to the block as a whole as far as its long-term um, viability. And so, um, the proposal here is to include some large utility infrastructure uh, in that um, sunken courtyard and then to return it all to a flat um, plaza environment that would uh, be accessible across all edges and really be um, an open environment for each of the storefronts that surround it to participate in the programming of what that space might be. So if we go to the next slide, uh, again, this is uh, one of the images that you just saw, but um, coming through the Sussex breezeway that we were just talking about, that's where those two in the rendering, it's on the lower or it's on the left hand side of that rendering. That is uh, the entrance then back into this courtyard and really the opportunity to um, uh, open that space up and create um, uh, a nice environment again, just like the bull and bear courtyard that we talked about that has uh, direct connection into the 
um, retail environments and other environments that are on those ground levels, um, but really create spaces that help um, uh, that, that enhance the office floors above as well. So we go to the next. Um, you had just um, seen this image with regard to the overall rooftop. Uh, maybe go to the next slide. Um, and, and again, just to reiterate here that this is um, this is about office um, function. It's not intended to be a, a, a restaurant or other environment. Um, and that this patio space would be uh, uh, hidden behind the existing um, uh, parapet walls that are uh, intended to be restored. And from an architectural standpoint, our goal uh, all along was to create very simple um, architectural components as we talk about the addition here. Um, things that were that were new and obviously not a rendition of what was uh, historic, but to be completely subordinate to the overall block um, and to be hidden from view as you look at the, the facade straight on as part of the guidelines uh, identify. Um, I, I think that's the last one in this slide. Um, thanks for the opportunity to give some more detail on, on these proposals. Thank you. Are there any questions for the applicant? I, I just have one question and this is the perfect image to, to land on for this. And I'm sorry, maybe I, I missed it, but I'm not sure I saw a plan view of this rooftop. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering if any of these elements on the rooftop are permanent or are they just kind of shown for, um, yeah. you know, rendering sake, are these planters planned to be uh, permanent here? Uh, no, the, these are not intended to be um, any built-in components. Um, obviously, we're careful that, that anything that would be proposed up here uh, would not be um, subject to any, you know, wind or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. um, but none of these are, are built-in um the sort of table and banquet thing that you see there is not, it's just a suggestion in the rendering. Gotcha. And there wouldn't be any like, you know, canopies or things like that no. that would be visible from, okay. No. Any other questions for the applicant? No, all right, thank you. Okay. Um, if you have any public comments, now's the time to let us know. So please use the hand raise button if you're joining us via Zoom. It should be at the bottom middle of your screen or dial star nine if you're joining by phone. And we do have, uh, Dana, you have your hand up and you've had it up for a while. So perhaps that's um, that's an old hand up, but uh, please, you're welcome to unmute and speak for up to two yeah. minutes if you'd like. Great. I want to thank all of you for um, suffering uh, this whole problem that we have with the uh, preservation movement because um, I, I think I've, I've invested about 60 years in the same problems about, you know, the soul and then the um, requirements of the Department of the Interior and then, you know, there are all these different um, uh, it rules and then you, you, you kind of Sometimes when you come down to the soul of a community, you just can't get at it. Uh, but now this most recent presentation uh, is completely different from what I was told by someone right before the meeting named Ashley McDonald, who assured me that none of the changes were going to bring restaurants and bars into the place. And almost every picture that I saw had an expanded restaurant or bars or you know and uh and, uh, and denver right now has been very generous about handing out liquor licenses and people who live in the neighborhood are really uh concerned about it so i i just i i i'm just totally confused about this process because um uh most of the um uh, uh lighting pictures and things that i have observed are very very contemporary um and and of course, one has her own uh, or his own 
philosophy about trying to um, uh, design something that gives people people a feeling of of uh, some time that has passed. My time is up. All right. Thank you, Dana. Uh, I have one more. It looks like Stuart, you're welcome to uh, unmute when you're ready. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. I'm uh, Stuart Hayden, 2525 Grape Street, uh, 80207. I'm breaking my rule and in, in following Dana Crawford. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, I would, um, I guess, ask the commission to, um, to vote no on this application, uh, specifically concerning um, guideline 2.41. Um, I feel like they're, given that it's, you know, it's, it's Larimer Square, um, one of the most photographed places in Denver, I believe that there are plenty of, of uh, historic photographs on which to reconstruct um, with historic accuracy, um, specifically the Kettle Arcade um, facade um, and, and doing so in a way that, um, you know, could still distinguish it as new construction. Um, so I don't think that it would be speculation to, to do something like that. Um, in fact, just while um, Abby was presenting, I was able to pull up a couple of photographs in a book and also on the, the Denver Public Library website um, of, of Larimer Street facades. Um, and so, yeah, I would um, hope that um, more could be done um, to really honor the, the past rather than um, leaving a gaping hole where it once was. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised. Okay. All right, thank you for your comments. Um, actually, Abby, was there any discussion with the applicant or anything that you found um, of historic photos of those storefronts? I know, we saw in the presentation a few different photos from different time periods, but I don't think it, either of those were during the period of significance, so. No, I mean, there's a lot of alteration over time. And I think we didn't focus a lot of staff on the idea of needing to return those completely because generally, you know, since it's already gone, Generally, you know, applicants get some flexibility. If they were proposing to return it to its original, we would be very concerned about, you know, figuring out, you know, exactly which of the multiple, you know, the you know, evolution of the storefronts and what would be appropriate. But generally, if something is completely missing, the applicant is giving some flexibility as far as not having to, you know, completely rebuild something that is basically in this case entirely missing versus, you know, like in storefront that was altered. This is really a completely missing feature. Um, so I guess we had not really looked at that um, as a major thing to consider. Also, you know, thinking about here just that it does, I know there's been a lot of discussion today about what do we keep from the alterations that happened in the 70s and 80s and what change and what do we need to preserve from that and we kind of felt like at least like keeping that arcade was keeping one aspect of that to kind of still tell the story of you know, how it had been changed over time okay thanks and um if the designation application were to be updated to change the time period that would be something is that something that needs to come from the public as a recommendation or staff or I mean, obviously we're not doing that today, but since you mentioned there has been discussion about it. Yeah, if, um, Abby, sorry, I saw you. Go ahead. Open. Okay, um, any changes to the period of significance would have to go through city council. It would be an ordinance update to the designation ordinance or to, for a new ordinance, um, changing the period of significance. So, um, so that could be from the public. It could be from, well, could be from the owner, I think, and it could be from DPD uh, and city council, I think, but okay. I'm not fully sure on that. It's in it, it. It's something that hasn't come up before um, in the time I've been here. It's it's come up before, but prior to me being here. 
Okay, thanks. All right. Um, well, let's move into deliberation. So what did everybody think about the design proposal um, in front of us for these buildings and how it meets the guidelines or does not? Well, I, I think the, uh, the kettle arcade facade may meet uh, the guidelines, but here we are already on Gary's uh, slippery slope. <laughs> it absolutely does not convey the spirit of what Larimer Square is, and uh, there needs, th there has to be a happy medium between, uh, you know, recreation of history with the wrought iron and and that that's that's already there, and just the total sterility of of uh, the arcade entrance as it's shown here. Um, it's the uh, it's the form following the function, which in facades are our business, and this one, like I said, if it meets the guidelines, I don't think it meets the spirit. So. Thanks, George. Is is the before we hear from Gary? I believe you were going to speak. Uh, George, is the Kettle Arcade the only concern you had with this application? Well, yes, because like a lot of uh, the other uh, decisions that we're asked to make, most of them are out of view of the public. They're in the mm -hmm. back uh, or they are on a rooftop uh, that is set back from the cornice or hidden by the, the parapets. So those are are pretty okay, but this isn't. <laughs> yeah. So go ahead and get other thoughts from commissioners on the Kettle Arcade, and then we can maybe move on to rooftop addition, other areas. Gary, what were your thoughts? Well, the entrance to the Kettle Arcade is the aspect of this application that bothers me the most. Um, uh, because because of guideline uh, 2.41, I guess it is. Um, I'm not thinking that the replacement of that entry needs to um, do more research into what might have been there originally, but it's really missing two columns because I think you can make a pretty strong argument that that facade would have had a couple of supports in the span and they don't you know they don't have to be replications of anything that was done historically but i do think that um having that second floor kind of float over that uh arcade response um is um a little a bridge too far um and I don't know that the introduction of a couple of columns uh, would interfere that dramatically with what the uh, design team is trying to achieve in terms of um, connecting the courtyards in the back with the street and with the uh, uh, building and the parking lot on the other side. Um, I, I would just like to add that the this is the component of this project that also um, gave me the, the greatest pause. Um, you know, there, I was, I had some internal debate when it became clear that structurally, you know, this building did not rely on a first floor structure to hold itself up. And so I then was thinking, well, um, you know, should there at least be a, interpretive sign or something that just kind of explains that this isn't that you know structurally this makes sense because when you look at it it doesn't make sense um and but i think i agree with gary that even if it wasn't structurally necessary we would have seen something that followed the um tripartite rhythm of the upper floor um, in how the first floor was divided up. And so I think 
um, I think it, I would agree that something needs to be there to visually support this um, so that it doesn't come across as um, just a completely missing piece of, of the building, a you know, very important piece of the building, namely the first floor. So I, I, I think I agree with Gary that something needs to be there to help convey that. Gary, were you going to piggyback on that? Well, I, I think the statement that there was no first floor structure is kind of a misrepresentation. Um, I think what is more accurate is that the second floor structure spans from party wall to party wall, and that this building didn't have vertical load paths of its own, except at the facade, because there would have been some support of that masonry facade that uh, historically would not have been a clear span like this drawing shows. Um, so, you know, the, the storefront would have originally been something more typical, more like the other typical storefronts on Larimer. There would have been a couple of columns, maybe more, but I'm thinking that the design of the building looks like there might have been a couple of columns uh, that would have supported the um, masonry above and that the storefront at the street would have been much like the other storefronts on the street historically. And there are historical photographs that kind of show what the character Larimer Square was originally. So um, I think uh, my objections to this application um, are ex exclusively about how that Kettle Arcade entry is treated. I think that's fair. Uh, when I first reviewed this application, to be honest, it didn't, this large of an opening didn't bother me too much because it is such a narrow building. And, um, and as staff has mentioned, you know, the storefronts changed so much over time and had so many iterations that I could see the argument for, um, you know, having it, it's clearly identifiable as a new um, intervention, uh, and it's removing non-historic fabric. So for those reasons, I, I was originally okay with this, but, you know, hearing, hearing your concerns, I do think they're valid. And Gary, I think you hit it on the head that, you know, even, even if they weren't to reconstruct what was original, um, there would have always been, and, and the photos that we've seen today from even its existing condition and, you know, a, a prior um, in storefront that was there. Uh, there's always columns under those two, you know, pairs of brackets, which makes sense since it's between the windows and that would be your load bearing um, path down. Uh, but so I, I would be in support of that. And I agree that it still maintains as a pathway in the connection, it seems to, um, still be in keeping with the goals of the project. Um, and it could still be contemporary, you know, as in not a reconstruction. Um, but I, I agree that that would be more in keeping and compatible with the proportions of the existing um, historic features that remain. And that this is just a stretch <laughs> uh, away from that. So I'd be in, I'd be in support of you know, a condition or a recommendation uh, to that effect. Yeah, I, the comment that you made about proportion, Kelly, I think is the thing that is what hits me as this is a contemporary interpretation that doesn't quite feel compatible. And I think we have grounds within 2.41 to object to it on that front. I agree. I think specifically 2.41C, replace missing pilaster elements. Yeah, they're not putting a storefront back, but uh, so it's not going to be a pilaster. It would be a column in this case, but they'd still be, you know, vertical load bearing. Or in this case, maybe they're ornamental, but to represent where there were originally pilasters in the storefront. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the Kettle Arcade. Anything else on this portion? Um, if not, I'd like to keep moving forward for the sake of time. Let's talk about the uh, rooftop addition. Were there any 
concerns or comments about that addition. I, I agree with the staff report. I think it is um, subordinate to the historic structure since it is set back, um, what, 18 and a half feet from the facade uh, and there aren't going to be elements above that parapet height uh, that are forward of the, of the rooftop addition. I also am happy to see that they were able to make that rooftop addition shorter than the adjacent building. I think that that helps a lot. So I appreciate that. And given the very simple design that it's clearly, you know, modern construction, not, not trying to be historic and just minimizing the impact, I was personally okay with this. I think, or I think it meets the guidelines. I see some nodding heads. Um, all right. So if there's no further discussion on the rooftop, um, let's talk about the lighting a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kind of hopping all over the place, but I'm just trying to touch on the ones that I thought um, really stuck out. So how did everybody um, interpret the lighting here? We've heard it described as a little bit more contemporary than we typically see, a little unique, especially in the arcade area. But right here, we're looking at um, the bull and bear courtyard. So let's talk about that. Thoughts? So um, <laughs> to keep Isn't this that, moving. So, so that's, uh, that's really all that uh, the uplighting uh, is, is not in front. And I see that they didn't, they specified that they're not going to use colored lights or anything like, so as long as they're not stringing party lights up above the parapets, I, I think it's uh, uh, it's fine because it's out of the public venue right away. Thanks, George. Does everyone agree? Larry, go ahead. Yeah, the only thing that was just a minor concern to me was I'm not sure if the uplights are compatible with um, dark skies requirements now that I believe Denver has, but I think that can get caught through a different review process than ours. That's a good point. Gary, Erica, do you agree with what's been said that since it's at the rear of the structure and not visible from the right away? All right. Um, and then the lighting in the arcade area, um, were there any concerns about that? It's very um, atypical of what we typically see uh with the kind of pattern it creates on the floor i see you're trying to find the slide thank you <laughs> there it is um and staff said that their um their interpretation was that as long as this doesn't spill out into the sidewalk in those more public uh, spaces and onto the building that they they felt that it was appropriate for that reason. Do you agree? Yeah, works for me. Great. I agree as well. All right. Were there any other aspects I didn't list that you felt required discussion? Oh, I guess I'll um, just go ahead. Um, I was looking a little bit at the pavers in the two courtyards. Um, they're quite different from one another, but I, I, I don't know if it. I, I think it just kind of goes back to what we just said with the lighting that um, you know there these are rear spaces that are entirely enclosed. Um, so. I think what's giving me pause is um, not really related to design guidelines and maybe more just personal preference. Um, so, but I just wanted to say that at first that gave me um, pause. Yeah, um, I would agree with your current instincts, which is that it's it's at the rear of the building and 
Um, it's also adjacent to, I mean, these renderings show how it's really adjacent to the most um, modern, I guess, yeah. uh, uh, what's the yeah. word I'm looking for? Interventions are located, yeah. Um, we didn't talk about the brick. I'm assuming everyone agrees with the staff recommendation that the brick should be a solid color um, rather than a blend. Okay. On the arcade. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so it sounds like we're all kind of in consensus agreeing with the staff recommendations, but that it we would recommend maybe an additional, I don't know if we want to do this as a condition uh, for columns to be added at that kettle arcade entry to better respect the original proportions of the storefront. Or however you choose to word it, who's going to make the motion? I, I can give it a try. I was waiting to see if Gary would do it but yeah I wasn't sure if he was writing <laughs> no I was uh, trying to find the motion mm -hmm. the other device Madam chair I move to conditionally approve application number 2022 coa-308 for the alterations and rooftop addition at 1410 through 1440 Larimer Street as per design guidelines 2.1, 2.3, 2.10, 2.13, 2.16, 2.30, 2.40, 2.41, 2.44, 2.47, 2.48, 3.5, 3.11, 3.12, 5.22, 5.23, 5 and 5.24, Character finding features for the Larimer Square Historic District presented testimony, submitted documentation and information provided in the staff report with the following conditions. One, that the brick in the Kettle Arcade be a single color that relates either to the adjacent masonry at the Larimer Street Arcade entrance or to the masonry in the Bull and Bear Courtyard. And that two, that the storefront on Larimer Street for the Kettle Arcade include um, two columns that more uh, compatibly represent the uh, historic storefront uh, proportions. I'll second. Thanks, Gary, for the motion and Erica for seconding. Um, is there any further discussion on the motion? I, I guess I'm just wondering, is it technically a storefront? <laughs> uh, the, the condition, as you had worded it, Gary said, the storefront on Larimer Street for the Kettle Arcade includes yeah, two might be columns. An entrance. Yeah, so I'll just make a friendly um, amendment uh, that Condition number two be rephrased um, not to include storefront, but um, the entrance. Of but I'll agree to that. Okay, thanks, Gary. Erica, do you agree to that? I do. All right. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion? All right. Um, George, you're on mute. Hi. Thank you. Um, Gary. Aye. Larry. Aye. Erica. Aye. And Kelly. Aye. All right, we have a unanimous vote. So the motion passes and this project is conditionally approved. Um, next up, we have 2022-COA-310 at 1413 through 1427 Larimer Street. Okay, thank you. I will already covered a lot of this and we I know still have more things on the agenda so thank you all for uh, you know continuing with this and I will try to move through this pretty quickly so we've already kind of talked about you know the connections of the buildings here 
Um, so up for review now is the proposed work that is at the Lincoln Buildings and the Congdon Buildings. So I'll kind of give a brief overview of the proposed alterations and then I'll focus individually on each building. So as discussed here on the facade, there is currently the walkway at the Congdon building that includes stairs down that kind of move through the building at the basement level that are just proposed for alteration to create instead a street level entrance that's also going to meet ADA requirements. Uh, then at the rear, um, removing non-historic alterations, uh, putting in a new aluminum framed storefront at the rear, and trying to kind of provide a more welcome connection to the parking garage that is on the opposite side of the alley and kind of make it a more clear entrance into Lammer Square. Then changing that kind of configuration within the building. I only show this because the, the stairs are under our preview that are on the outside. Obviously anything on the interior here, this is all outside of our purview. So any alterations they make to the interior um, are totally outside our purview, but we do have purview over you know, how it kind of comes down. So I just wanted to show this as an illustration that you can see how now you kind of come down the stairs to the basement level. Instead, in the new plan, the stairs will be moved internally. So it'll be internally that you move between levels within the building. Um, but anything on the interior is not within our purview. Okay, and then finally, we also then have the rooftop addition that is um, proposed for the top of the Lincoln Building. Okay, so returning then to the Congdon building. Um, so scope of work for the Congdon building. So we have facade restoration and some window repair. Um, removing the steps down to the basement passages, the walkway, covering with a new floor and installing an ADA accessible ramp to the entry um, and moving those stairs to the interior. Um, and then removing that existing recessed storefront at the walkway and replacing with an aluminum framed operable partition wall um, that's designed to align with the adjacent. Um, the applicant would like to add an operable partition wall that could be stacked to the side when businesses are open to create an open passage, um, but could be closed otherwise. Um, and they are proposing to keep the same recessed placement in the opening um, that the storefront currently has. So it would be at that, you know, the storefront would be at that same location um, as what you see there currently, it would just be operable. So staff finds, I'll go ahead and advance. So you can see there that proposed. Um, staff finds this proposal to be compatible with the existing conditions since the central bay of the Condon storefront has already been altered with the creation of the walkway with steps and the recessed storefront. The removal of the stairs and the return of street level access at the central bay will return the storefront to a more historic configuration. While the creation of a corridor through the building does not represent historic patterns, the corridor is being placed in a location that has already been extensively altered. The movable partition will be recessed following the existing storefront placement and the aluminum frame and glass partition will be simple and modern in design, but with a configuration that aligns with adjacent storefronts. Um, so staff's only condition recommended um, regarding the storefront would be that additional information be included on this partition wall. So, as staff has worked with the applicant quite a bit. They were originally proposing a nano wall here. Staff felt that that wasn't appropriate because it didn't have the features that would really visually align with the adjacent. So the staff has been working with the applicant and they agreed to construct an operable wall here that would have a transom and kick plate alignment so that when it's closed, it would visually align with the adjacent. Uh, but the applicants have a little bit of struggle finding exactly who the manufacturer that is going to be. So some of the plans that you have here refer to it still as a nano wall. Um, nano wall doesn't 
produce quite what they want. Um, they have also um, looked at Eurowall, but aren't sure if that's going to work. So we would just have a can recommend a condition. Um, you know, if the commission feels that what's proposed here is okay, we would still just uh, recommend a condition. They really detail drawings and manufacturer specs be provided for whatever manufacturer they identify that can uh, construct a wall, you know, construct an operable kind of partition here that looks like what is shown in the drawings. Um, so here you can see then as well, just that you can see the new um, floor that will meet ADA requirements there that with the slight ramp and then the fact that that new installed storefront uh, will have that same recess as what is there currently. Okay, so on to the rear. So on the left there, you see the current rear configuration um, of the Congdon and Lincoln buildings. And then there you see the proposed. Um, so you have the kind of removal of the non-historic um, or outside of the period of significance alterations there that you have at the rear of the Congdon and the installation of a new storefront entrance. Um, and then you also have the kind of recladding and um, restoration of kind of historic floor levels um, with new windows at the Lincoln and the rear addition. Um, so at the Congdon, the proposal is to remove the non-historic rear wall added in the 1980s create a new uh, window, create new window and door openings and install a new brick cladding. Um, the brick to be a uh, general shale ballpark, which um, really similar to what is there now. Um, and then also install an aluminum frame glass curtain wall system at the first floor. Um, and then it will have uh, five aluminum framed fixed windows above. Um, that second story bridge to the parking garage that's there currently will remain. Okay, and then on to the Lincoln building. So like the other buildings, uh, facade restoration and window repair is part of the scope. Um, then there also will be some storefront alterations. Um, so the existing storefronts are not historic, um, but you can see currently um, there are multiple doors. Um, in the storefront. So the applicant is proposing uh, to remove the two doors on either side of the central entry and to replace them with just simple glass storefronts. Um, these storefronts will have transoms and kick plates that align with the adjacent storefronts. And these will be uh, wood storefronts. Um, so staff find this meets guidelines and you're just kind of compatible, simplified storefronts when. Um, you're replacing a non-historic feature. And then we have the rear. Um, so uh, the rear wall will be altered, uh, new stucco will be put on, it will be reclad. And we previously had the discussion about um, that the original uh, floor levels are gonna be kind of recreated at the rear half of the Lincoln building. Um, so going to infill the non-historic window openings, create new window openings that align with adjustments made to those interior floor levels, and then the rear wall will be reclad in stucco. Um, there'll be four windows at each floor, um, measuring seven feet, eight inches by two feet, ten and a half inches. And then we have the new rooftop addition. So the new... Yeah, so the rooftop addition will be set back 30 feet, eight inches from the facade. There will be a rooftop patio enclosed by a metal railing that will be located in front of the addition. It will be set back 10 feet from the facade of the building. Um, the addition here is very similar in design to the one you saw across the street. The addition will be clad in a combination of aluminum framed glass curtain wall and fiber cement panels. Um, so it will be 13 feet, eight inches tall. Um, and we'll also have an operable nano wall um, that provides access onto that rooftop patio. 
So staff is recommending approval with the condition that additional construction details be provided for the operable partition wall uh, to be installed at the Congdon building. Thanks, Abby. Are there any questions for staff? Um, I, I did have one question that I wish I had caught earlier when we were talking about the demolition, but um, on the walkway, um, what's called the walkway, it looks to me like it's not just the storefront that the setback storefront that's removed, but the two columns, there are two columns that sit forward of that in the open space that are kind of um, the stairs and the railings that are there now kind of move around those. And those actually look to me to be historic cast iron columns, they certainly match what we see on the other sections of the storefront. Do you, are, did you catch that, Abby, or do you know anything no, I'm about really, those? I'm really embarrassed to admit that with the amount of time I spent reviewing this application, I didn't notice that detail either. So I think that's a question for the applicant. Okay, yeah, it's a lot. I, I did not catch it until just now myself, so. Yeah, great question. I didn't notice that either. Um, okay, any other questions for staff? All right, uh, let's hear from the applicant. So um, for the record, it's the same applicant that we've heard from in the previous three <laughs> uh, applications. So um, no need to repeat the name and address. Right. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I, I kind of in again in the effort of um, not repeating um, what was just said, because I think there was um, a, a good summary of what the proposal entails. Um, I, I did want to um, maybe touch on the section here that you see at the bottom of the page uh, quickly um, to just make sure that it was clear um, how those uh, spaces are intended to operate and that the goal is to provide this clear connection uh, again from the parking garage that you see in the section all the way on the on the right hand side or on the left hand side through the Congdon building to Larimer Street and again through the Kettle Arcade to the to the Bull and Bear Courtyard and really celebrate that connection the whole way across the you know the perpendicular line of the block as well. Um, and just for clarity, in case it wasn't wasn't clear here, right? This is a section that is looking toward Fifteenth Street. Um, maybe we can go to the go to the next slide. Um, there was a, a, a point brought up um, uh, by Erica, and and that um, is correct that there are two existing uh, columns. Um, whether or not they are um, uh, cast iron, uh, I don't. I, I don't know for sure uh, to say uh, right now, but the proposal was to remove those and uh, I apologize for not making that more clear earlier. Um, the intention uh, is that this passage would have the same sort of openness uh, that we had talked about uh, on the other on the other side. So um, as the earlier comments went through again, um, the idea of removing the stairways directly down, uh, and adding a flat entrance uh, at the storefront facade allows us to get um, an accessible route back into the building to where an elevator can be located so that we can make sure that the connection to the garage is, is accessible. Um, maybe go to the next slide. Um, part of that is that the elevation of the first floor of the Congdon building uh, is elevated higher than the elevation of the sidewalk in the street. And so keeping the recessed um, storefront element uh, allows us to uh, slope the walkway up to get to that level. Um, uh, this isn't a full ramp. This is uh, lower than the one to 20 provisions. This would just be uh, a vertical slope that would get you to that um, operable partition that we're proposing there um, at the center. Um, Again, this is uh, the intention for this uh, from a design standpoint is to pr promote that uh, activity into the building and promote um, that 
people on the on the street and visitors to the street uh, can understand that access point um, without being unsure whether they can proceed into the building to actually get to those more public circulation functions. Um, maybe we go to the, the next. Um, I, again, with the idea about this on the back, um, on the alley side, of course, the garage is to the right-hand side of um, these images, uh, and the idea of creating a, a much more welcoming and open environment um, so that as you exit the garage uh, headed this way, that it's clear that there's um, uh, you're intended to go through this facade to get to Larimer Street. That's certainly the design goal there. Um, maybe go to the next. Um, and, and just for clarity, as you enter in, so this is as you enter in from the alley um, and you have the larger volume of space. Um, again, the stairs that get you um, through the center, take you up in the middle of the building to get to Larimer on a more sort of ceremonial stair that gets you up. And then the core that includes the stair and elevator exists off to the right. Um, and then you'd be able to come up a, uh, one level and get to that landing and make your way out um, to Larimer. Um, yeah, go ahead, go to the next one. Um, I don't know that there's a lot more to be said here, except again, as we were looking at the opportunity to put um, uh, the rooftop addition here and expand the uh, office uh, offering there, that we're certainly very conscious about keeping the facade and the facade view um, clear of any of that addition so that when um, when that comes on, it doesn't obstruct from the uh, historic facade. And maybe if we go to the last image here, um, again, reiterating just that this is uh, really of the same um, material set, the material palette that we showed on the Burger Building uh, with the fiber cement wall panels, the curtain wall um, system that has a, a, the operable section here toward the front that allows some access to the rooftop component, which again, uh, this is an, an office function. It's not set up to support um, a restaurant or other elements uh, at this roof level. It's an, uh, an office amenity. Um, uh, to the same degree, there are no permanent um, uh, elements planned out here, except for the pavers themselves and the perimeter railing. Uh, the remainder of that is is not intended to be built in as a permanent feature. Um, yeah, I think I think that's uh, all I want to be able to say on those. And, and thank you for uh, the time today. Thank you. All right. Any questions for the applicant? Um, I. I... I appreciate you addressing um, what I raised. So I just wanted to clarify that those two columns that sit forward of the, um, the setback storefront in the middle of the Congdon building are, are to be removed and you are not clear on their material or their date. Uh, yes, the proposal is to uh, remove those. Um, um, and, and I would have to go back to our to our resources to make sure that those weren't original cast iron. Um, my recollection was that they were wood, um, wood clad to look um, like the adjacent um, components, but that were not actually um, that were not actually cast iron. All right. Any other questions for the applicant? No. All right, thank you. Um, are there any public comments on this project? Please use the hand raise button at this time. Yeah. Oh, we have a hand raise. Nope. Yes. There we go, Stuart. Uh, sorry, my mouse is jumpy. Hold on a second, Stuart. Let me uh, let me get back to this part. Cool. Whenever you're ready. Well, thank you. Um, so I'm still Stuart Hayden at 2525 Grape Street. Um, and I have the same concern with the Congdon building as I did with the Kettle Arcade. Um, and um, in addition to um, 
guideline 2.41, page 23 of the guidelines, um, it's not a specific numbered guideline, but it um, is addressing the reconstruction and replacement of character defining features. And it says when a window, um, door, storefront, or other character defining feature has been significantly altered or is missing, a range of reconstruction and replacement treatments may be appropriate. Um, and the last sentence in that uh, paragraph goes on to say that um, an accurate reconstruction is the most appropriate approach. Um, and especially concerning those columns, um, I think that should be further investigated. And like I said, there are plenty of photographs of um, this building in particular. Um, and I'm looking at one right now in um, Tom Noel's Denver's Larimer Street um, book. Um, and you could see very similar columns. So that's especially um, concerning. Um, so yeah, a similar treatment to the Kettle Arcade um, or a, a rejection of the, of the application um, would be grand. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, did anybody catch, I didn't get the page number. Page 23. Thank you, Stuart. I was looking for it. <laughs> All right, any other public comments? I don't see any hands raised, no. Okay. All right, um, Abby, any recap before we move into, okay. So let's move into deliberation. Um, all right, let's go ahead and start with that Congdon entrance. Um, and Erica, I'm glad that you pointed that out. And I did look back at the demo application and it was indicated. I think it was just confusing. It was hard to read because you're looking at the elevation and I wasn't realizing they were forward of the recess storefront. So I, I see how we all kind of missed that. Right. But, uh, it, it wasn't shown in plan, so it couldn't see. Yeah. Did you want to um, kick us off on this conversation, Erica, since you brought that up? Sure. Yeah, I, you know, I, um, I, I that raises some big concerns for me, I think, um, in, and I don't, we approved the demolition, so I'm not really sure how to go about addressing this, but mm -hmm. maybe we can still do it in, in this piece as far as, um, uh, I, I, I just feel like that this component, at the very least, should be um, restudied or, or redesigned um, to incorporate those, assuming they're historic. Um, you know, they could, I suppose, um, do some further research to determine if they are or are not. Um, however, I, you know, I, given that they were left behind when the whole walkway um, was inserted um, makes me think that they, even if they're not historic themselves, they replace something that was there historically. Um, and so I, I just think that that whole piece needs to be rethought. And what do you, what are your thoughts on the um, mobile partition? Well, um, yeah, I don't really know how it, I'm working under the assumption that these are historic um, features, components of the, his, uh, the storefront. And so I'm not really sure if that could even work with those columns in place um, or, or not. So I guess that's why I kind of um, think it just needs to be re redesigned with that in mind. Gary, what were you gonna? Well, um, I, I started to look at page 22 uh, more closely, and I would, I think it needs to be confirmed, so I agree with Erica, but I believe that those uh, columns are cast iron and perhaps original based on how the bases are detailed. Um, if they were wood, I'm not sure that well, they could have replicated it as closely as they as as it is, but um, I think as, there's a strong possibility that those are original cast iron columns. So I think 
further investigation about that is necessary. Um, and if they turn, if they uh, are original, um, removing them is uh, not acceptable. Kelly, um, I just yeah. want to suggest Happy. if you look at page four of the second application, the appendix, mm -hmm. there are a couple historic photos. I'm not seeing the columns there, but you might just, if you're thinking about like looking for stuff on the columns, you might look at those two historic photos that are on the fourth page of the second application with the appendix materials. Okay. Might take me a minute to find that. I've combined all the PDFs. <laughs> I know that there's, I just wanted to wreck you there. So these are applications are so huge that, you know. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so Abby, Jen, Adam, can someone kind of let us know if there's a problem with the fact that we conditionally approved, conditionally, <laughs> the demolition um, based on, you know, the replacement plan or um, so what the, the fact that we didn't see those columns are we how do we approach this is it okay to now have a condition that they be preserved when we already had a conditional approval to remove them i don't really know um it, your approval was conditional upon their approval of the replacement plan yeah. so if you don't approve removal of those columns because they're historic, then that is one thing. If you do, if you if you think that it's okay that they're historic or they're not, you find they're not historic, um, and it's okay to remove them, then that's part of the replacement plan. I think that's Adam yeah. just popped his video on, so he has more to say. I think. Hi, Adam Hernandez, Assistant City Attorney. I think this all depends on what you're asking. Are you asking to to reverse the conditional approval of the demolition? No, I think what we're looking at is just, so the conditional approval of the demolition was for a wide variety of things that were being demolished. And one portion of that were two columns. And I think we're saying that if those were historic, those should be preserved and so, I mean, I don't think it would reverse the entire approval, but that those be incorporated in the replacement plan, that, they, that those two columns be there. So <clears throat> that would take some sort of change to the, the demolition approval, even conditionally that you've already done. Um, I am going to need to look at how that is to be accomplished under Robert's rules. It's probably a motion to reconsider, um, but I need to figure out the exact way and when that needs to be done. So we can keep talking about the application and while you're looking that up, right? Yes. Okay. And you can just pop back on when you've got that. Yeah, but don't make any motions on sure. this yet in case there is some sort of timing issue okay thank you Th thanks adam the, um, other thing, the other thing is that abby said she um has that appendix up and let me um abby i'm making you a co-host so you can share your screen should let you do that momentarily okay if I didn't just boot you accidentally. Which... No, I'm still here. <laughs> just haven't gotten All right, let me, um, let me get out of, let me have you stop sharing the screen or not, just, let, me, let me stop sharing, but you gotta stop touching my mouse. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go, stop share. Okay, now you can do it. <laughs> okay. For those of you who are following along at home, we do remote control, and so it makes it much more complicated when um, we're trying to do this. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. 
I just wanted to show, you know, as you're debating this, just that, I mean, to me, it looks like those are two thin round columns that are in the location of where they're now those other columns. So at least to me, it looks like these are columns aren't showing up in this photo and that this is showing a different like round column, which leads me to think that what's there now isn't historic, but other people may have other interpretations. I just wanted people to see this photo. Yeah, thanks. It, I mean, it looks to me like those are non-historic columns that replaced historic columns in those same locations. Yeah. Okay. Um, did, all right. Did well, thank Gary you. Gary want to say something? Well, oh, I, sorry. I, I, I'm speculating. I agree that what that photograph shows is what looks like a pipe column. They are clearly structural. So if they are eliminated, something is going to have to be done to carry the load of the masonry wall, et cetera, above, which doesn't show how they're going to do that and how it might affect the appearance of what they're doing. But maybe their but plan also, takes that into consideration. It could be, it could be. Um, I'm, because the columns in the current photographs appear to match so closely the larger columns that, we, that show in this photograph, I'm just speculating, but at some later time when the storefront was modified again, if they, if they found some old cast iron columns that matched the facade and installed them, um, how does that change how we approach this? In other words, a later facade change complied with the standards in a way that now is better than um, what was done before. Um, even though they were not the original columns, they were old cast iron columns that matched the columns that were there and were used in place of these pipe columns in a later uh, project. So there's a lot of speculation going yeah. on there. Oh yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, so. So we just throw all that out? I, I think so. we're, <laughs> Where I fall in this, I guess, based on seeing this photo is who knows if they're original or they're not, but as Erica said, likely there were always columns in that location. I feel like this is kind of similar to what we looked at at the Kettle Arcade and that I think I'm, this is the one part of this application I also had issue with. and. I think to me, it's more, I take more issue with this change than I did at the Kettle building because at the, the Kettle Arcade was already an open space, like right where for passage, whereas this is really going to change the um, perception from the street to during, you know, all open hours, this is going to be completely open, the entire front of that center bay. And so I just worry that that looks again, like the proportions are not compatible to the historic building. So whether those columns are removed or not, there should probably be something in their place and that the new proposal should respect the pattern, the historic pattern of that and rhythm of that storefront. And so I think that's where I'm falling now after all this speculation. Um, I'm. I have some real concerns about that operable partition. I think it's gonna be really difficult to manufacture something like that that's gonna be um, compatible to the rest of that storefront. And I think even if you do get some mullion in there to show a transom and everything, the way it's gonna fold in the center of those perceived kind of column locations is really, not going to have that visual effect. Like typically those columns feel more substantial than the glass next to it. And they are continuous because that's the structure. Whereas here it's gonna have like a fold, a line in the center of them. And 
I, I guess I just have some real concerns about that operable partition in general. And I think that the proportions of what goes in this opening should match um, the proportions in the other bays. Kelly, I, I fully agree with you. And I, I think you were kind of earlier when you were asking me about my thoughts on the um, operable partition, you were kind of <laughs> maybe not leading me, but you know, making it um, providing an opportunity <laughs> uh, to think about that a little bit more. And I, but I think you're absolutely right that um, in the end, you know, it doesn't matter per se what um, historically or whether these columns that are there now are historic or not. I mean, it does, but what we also see is that there were columns there and that this change is, um, is altering the storefront um, too much and changing its proportions, et cetera. And that the way that a partition would fit into that um, also changes that dramatically because of, um, I think you're right, the, the way those would fold, I don't see how that could work. So I agree. I wasn't trying to lead you. I was just wondering if others had <laughs> any concerns yes. Yes. <laughs> for the record. <laughs> yeah, Larry. Yeah, so I, I also shared that concern. I think kind of doubling back to the, the columns that are in the facade, aligned with the facade of the building. Um, yeah, I, I agree with your idea that as long as those are you know replaced with something, that maintains the rhythm um, and the idea uh, within 2.41 of missing, missing pilaster elements. Um, I guess they're not missing currently, but they would become missing. Um, that, that that would be acceptable to me. And I would imagine that they would have not a lot of reason to remove what's there if it you know functionally works. But I suppose that can be their call since they don't, we don't know if they're historic um as long as they got replaced and then with the degree of setback of the folding partition for entrance it doesn't seem like the columns would necessarily be, be an, a hindrance to that opening up properly um and so i think if we're evaluating it it's a bit more tricky because I don't think it would necessarily detract from the um, rhythm of the facade to have something that's set, you know, 12 feet or so back from the facade that would be able to move. I think more of the question is, yeah, does that, when that's fully open and you have this, you know, three, essentially three bay wide opening that historically, if it were, you know, a storefront that were set back, those bays would, you know, remain uh, aligned to the um, the column grid, even if they were, you know, had doors opening into them. Yeah, is, is that historically appropriate, I guess? And yeah, I, I think there's enough question marks here that I would go along with everybody if we felt that that is not really historically appropriate. Does that make any sense? <laughs> Yeah, so I think, it, am I hearing you correctly that you were saying the operable partition you're not necessarily as concerned with in the, in the sense that you'd have the columns forward, so it's not that you don't get that perception of the bays, right? So would you be, maybe I'm not following, would you be um, amenable to some sort of operable partition that is set back if those columns in front were were there? I think I am, but if other commissioners have sure. objections to that, then I'm open to hear that, absolutely. Okay. Gary, what were you gonna say? Well, I, I think what I'm hearing Larry say is that if the columns in the original storefront location remain, however, whatever design those columns are, the fact that that movable partition is set back is it's 
less critical that the proportions and the mullions and all of that uh, are proportionally correct, I think, is what you were saying, Larry. Is that kind of, in other words, because it's back, it's not so important that everything lines up precisely as if it was out in front. I guess, yeah, more what I'm thinking is that if the, if that um, foldable partition was the only element in the facade at all that established the rhythm, then I would say that it doesn't really work because if it's open, then we have no sense of the rhythm and it will be open most of the time that the public is using Larimer Square. When you get the columns in front, I, I still think that the, you know, where it folds should align with the columns, but I think that the fact of it being a foldable partition, if we're questioning that as an overall concept, I don't necessarily object as much to that if we have these fixed columns that are there so that when it's open, you still read the bays. I, I see what you're saying. I, I could see that. And I see some nodding heads. Erica, it looks like agrees with that. Gary, what were you gonna say? Well, I'm, what I was gonna say is that when it's open and folded against the wall, it might actually be more visually obtrusive than when it's in place. I don't think the, um, the rendering image actually shows it, what it would look like if it's when it's folded in place. Um, I'll look again, but um, I don't know that that um, changes how we vote on the matter, but I do think that folding partition is somewhat problematic, not necessarily from a preservation point of view, but just visually. Didn't we uh, sort of have the similar discussion when the uh, entry area of the downtown library was discussed and we had a matter of doors that were inside uh, a glassed in uh, atrium and then what's interior and what's exterior to setting the partition wall back behind the columns make it more an interior issue and out of our purview there's a way to explain away the problem but you know well i think it's still the exterior envelope like yeah. that is the barrier between the interior and the exterior is that wall just trying to help <laughs> <laughs> um okay if you look on page 10 of their submittal where they show the rendering of that opening without the columns, they do kind of show that operable partition open and folded, but it's the nano wall type mm -hmm. other than um, the one with the transom bar and all of that. And um, it's gonna be hard to determine how visually acceptable this is, this proposal is or not, um, unless the rendering more accurately shows what they're proposing. So, so, all right, there's already a condition that was recommended by staff for providing more details on this operable partition since the manufacturer hasn't been identified yet and they're still working through the details. So let me try and kind of summarize this so we can maybe move on. Is, is it accurate, I guess, now that we've discussed at length, it sounds like we're all on the same page that similar to the Kettle Arcade, we recommend that the proportions of the columns be respected um, so they don't have to be retaining the existing, which appear to be non-original based on the photos and the application, but having something there because um, that would be more compatible to the proportions of the historic nature of this building. So having two columns in that bay. So we all agree on that, right? I see everybody nodding heads, so that's good. So then the other aspect is it sounds like we are open to this idea of the operable partition because it is set back. And if there are those columns in front, you do still have that proportion. And it sounds like the design team is still working on figuring out how to accomplish the design shown in the application, what manufacturer to use, 
and that may, Gary, as you implied, impact how it pockets on the side. So I think the real question for us is, are we comfortable with that being a condition that goes back to staff, or do we think that there are so many unknowns that we need to um, deny it to be able to see more details of that partition? I think that to me is, is the factor. And here we haven't even discussed any of the other parts of this application, um, which I'd like to do next. And I think that could be more brief. Uh, Abby, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, you could also just make it a condition to remove this these alterations from the application so that you could review, and if you're okay with the rest of it, approve the rest of the application, and then only these storefront alterations would have to come back instead of denying the whole application. That's, that's a great idea. Um, I think I personally would prefer that option that Abby just outlined. And can I get some nodding heads? Yes, if you agree with that. Okay, so unanimously, I see everybody agrees that removing this from this application so that this piece comes back to us um, is the way we'd like to move forward. So we'll go ahead and do that. Um, I don't want to belittle the rest of the application, but <laughs> um, since we looked at another rooftop addition and this one too is set back from the facade um, using similar modern materials, was everyone um, comfortable with that? Seems to meet the guidelines nod your head yes if you agree that the rooftop okay and um the replacement plan for the uh rear wall that's being yeah there we go uh thank you abby or jen i don't know who's moving the slides but that's helpful um were there any um concerns about this uh new facade and at the rear it's at the rear of the building there were non-original um, brick and openings. So I think unless anyone speaks up, we're all good. Is there anything else about this application you felt warranted discussion? All right. Um, seeing as I'm not hearing anything, who would like to make the motion? Do we want to wait to hear from Adam about Oh, well, now that we're not actually saying they have to keep those columns, I don't think that's an issue. But thank you, Adam, for helping out. <laughs> and chime in, Adam, if, there, if you feel otherwise. But if we're not saying they have to keep those columns, I don't think that's an issue. Correct. If, if you did feel like the, the demolition approval had to change, there'd be some weird stuff we'd have to do right now, but it appears that's not the case. Great, so let's avoid the weird stuff. All right, who's gonna make the motion? Quick question about the motion mm -hmm. and the column component of that. Are we removing the columns as a talking point from this motion or do we want to have something referring to them in this motion? That's a good question. Um, so Abby, if we're just removing this section? Yeah, I would say for simplicity's sake, like we have all your, your deliberation. So, you know, I have it, the applicant has it. I would just say remove all, you know, alterations to the Congdon storefront from the application because that's the simplest. And or the Congdon your, entrance? Yeah. So yeah, they because yeah, just remove the alterations to the Congdon entrance from the application. That's simple, and then they have your deliberation to base a redesign on. And maybe this is nitpicking, but there are multiple entrances, so uh, <laughs> I feel like we should just Larimer say storefront Street. alterations oh, okay. because uh, there are multiple Larimer... uh, there are multiple entrances on Larimer. Yeah, I was thinking if you said that you remove all work on the ground floor, then technically that could be interior as well, even though that's not really your purview. So I think if you were to make it clear, very specific you could, what you're doing. 
You could say remove alter all alterations at the walkway on Larimer because the walkway is the name for that is only this section. So if you reference the walkway, I think that would be clearly or saying the walkway entrance. I think that clearly defines this entrance. Okay. So remove all alterations to the Congdon building walkway entrance. All right, Adam, yeah. So a question on this condition, are, are, is the commission saying that any alterations to this entrance, storefront, whatever we're going to call it, do not meet the guidelines? Is that why the condition is to remove that? Or is it just that what you are seeing does not meet the guidelines? It's that what we are seeing does not meet the guidelines. And we feel it needs to come back for review but shouldn't, but the rest of the application does meet the guidelines. Well, I don't know if that's the best route then, because what you're saying is this is conditionally approved upon removing all alterations to this facade, whatever. And so what you're saying is in order to meet guidelines, there can be no alterations to this facade. And I don't think that's what you're implying. I if you feel that the, the application is almost there but something is missing then either the the continuance or denial route would be the best path forward but um if if we like remove something from a scope i mean owners and applicants have the opportunity to try a different design and come back all the time i mean just because we say what was in the application doesn't meet the guidelines doesn't mean they can't propose something else in the future so how would this be different from that because you're you're granting an approval you're saying this thing is approved but it's only approved because you're removing something and by removing that you're saying that the only way to meet the guidelines is to remove this okay Erica, what were you gonna? No, okay. I, I, I think I just don't follow, but I, I feel like we've removed things from the scope, kind of redirecting applicants to say something in this scope um, we are not approving and should be come, come back to us that we are approving the rest. Yeah, I'm, yeah, that's kind of how I'm interpreting it too. I'm not following. So are you saying this is a two-part approval? You approve today and then you approve something later? We're saying we approve this today, you know, as long without the changes to that entrance. And that gives them the opportunity to, you know, come back with just that entrance component. They're approving everything but what's proposed for the entrance. That's it. And so if so, so that portion is denied and the rest of it is approved. That's what they're saying. So that basically if they wanted to go ahead and apply for permits to do that and to get a COA, all they would need to do is to remove these pages. They could move ahead with the rest of them and then they could come back with a different application for the entrance. Okay, that, that may be the better way to couch it rather than part of this is approved and part of this is denied because the ordinance says projects are approved, approved with conditions or denied. So I just want to make sure we, we all understand what we're doing here. Yeah, my suggestion when I was saying remove it was just that, that the applicant said it be removed from the plan set so that it's not part of this application. And But then they could certainly do that, not remove it as far as remove from the project permanently, just remove from the current plan set to be for this plan set to be approved. Okay. All right. So who's going to make this highly discussed motion and use the language from the current plan set? Larry, I think you were writing. Am I gonna, is it okay if I pick on you? All right, I'll, I'll give this a try. Um, let me finish this note here. Okay. 
I move to conditionally approve application number 2022-GOA-310 for the alterations and rooftop addition at 1413 through 1427 Larimer Street as per design guidelines 2.1, 2.3, 2.10, 2.13, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.47, 2.48, 2.49, 2.50, 2.51, 2.52, 2.53, 2.54, 2.55, 2.56, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.60, 2.61, 2.62, 2.63, 2.64, 2.65, 2.66, 2.67, 2.68, 2.69, 2.70, 2.71, 2.72, 2.73, 2.74, 2.75, 2.76, 2.77, 2.78, 2.79, 2.80, 2.81, 2.82, 2.83, 2.84, 2.85, 2.86, 2.87, 2.88, 2.89, 2.90, 2.91, 2.92, 2.93, 2.94, 2.95, 2.96, 2.97, 2.98, 2.99, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.47, 2.48, 2.49, 2.50, 2.51, 2.52, 2.53, 2.54, 2.55, 2.56, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.00, 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04, 2.05, 2.06, 2.07, 2.08, 2.09, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21
We also find that 720 Downing Street is a Denver square with boxy massing, classical ornamentation with its hipped roof and central dormer and symmetrical facade. Uh, historically, the structure did have a full width front porch that has been demolished and replaced with a 1980s alteration. Uh, the brick has been painted and a large two-story addition has been constructed in the, the rear. The applicant states that the structure lacks integrity due to these 1980s alterations and um, the postmodern porch that has been added to the structure, alterations to the window openings, the shutter additions. Um, therefore, staff have evaluated this structure on the seven qualities of integrity. Um, so obviously here we have the front of the building. It's very hard to get um, images of the side just because the lot is pretty tight. Um, but here is that rear addition um, that is quite large, um, totally contained within the rear of the structure though. Um, here are those 1980s plans um, that show when that porch um, was modified into that current configuration and that rear addition added to the structure. Um, these are alterations that are unlikely something we would approve today, particularly the porch alteration. Um, however, the rear addition is probably something we would consider as it's subordinate in height to the primary structure um, and terms of placement is somewhat subordinate to the primary structure. Um, <clears throat> here is a 1929 Sanborn map and 1933 aerial image of the structure. You can see the simple boxy massing and um, that full width porch that has been uh, demolished and replaced with that 1980s porch. <clears throat> Um, and then finally, here are the seven aspects of integrity um, that we evaluated the structure upon directly from our ordinance. Um, so staff felt that this structure uh, did retain integrity in six of the seven qualities of integrity. And we do feel that it contributes to the history, architecture and characteristics architectural characteristics of the neighborhood as a Denver square and the geography of the district. So in terms of the seven aspects of integrity, um, 720 Downing Street is in its an original location and it's on its original lot. Um, the setting uh, for the, the structure has largely been preserved due to the preservation and designation of the East 7th Avenue Historic District. Um, so the surrounding context and setting is very intact for this structure. As far as design, 720 Downing Street is a simple Denver square. Um, it does have some elements of higher design quality, including its arched window openings, stone sills, decorative brackets, and large overhanging eave with a large central dormer. While the addition and porch do alter the original design intent, staff do not feel that these are major alterations that could not be reversed based on evidence and sister properties in the neighborhood. In terms of materials, the 1929 Sanborn fire insurance map does show a two-story dwelling with a full width porch and a partial width rear porch with a wood shingle roof as denoted by an X. Um, the structure's form and original brick cladding remain intact, although the brick has been painted and the full width porch and rear partial width porch have been removed. Uh, visual surveys indicate um, most of the windows are replacement windows. Um, however, the window on the second floor in the central um, opening is the original leaded glass. Um, again, we feel that these could easily be reconstructed based on sister houses and with our design guidelines. Um, where we feel the structure does lack some integrity is workmanship. Um, so workmanship is defined as physical evidence of a particular culture or people's craft during any given period of history. Um, because of some of the alterations to the structure, we don't feel that it displays an exceptional ev evidence of workmanship or craft beyond its brick construction, um, but even that has been obscured with the painting. In terms of filling 19, um, and this is, sorry, this is not supposed to say 1920, 720 Downing Street is um, typical, typical of vernacular Denver squares in the East 7th Avenue um, neighborhood. 
And then finally, um, we do find that is associated with the early development patterns of the city and the East 7th Avenue Historic District. So as we do feel that it maintains um, seven at six of the seven aspects of quality, um, we are recommending that the commission deny this request to um, define the structure as non-contributing to the East 7th Avenue Historic District. Thank you, Brittany. Are there any questions for staff? No. Nope. All right, let's hear from the applicant. All right, looks like the applicant has been promoted. Thank you so much for your patience. I know it's been a long meeting. Um, you have up to 10 minutes. Unmute yourself when you're ready and start with your name and address for the record. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Sexton, and um, my address is 1627 Gilpin Street in Denver. Um, I'm the architect who is um, helping the owners uh, try to resolve some situations with their, with their home and make it work better with their living situation. Um, I'm not the first architect that's worked on this project um, with them, and not the first architect who has worked with Brittany um, in trying to resolve some of the challenges with the property. Um, over the years, you can tell that there's been some changes to the inside and outside. I mean, you don't know that there's changes to the inside, but um, there's been some very significant changes to the inside of this house, which um, are somewhat reflected on the exterior. Um, there's a very large addition on the rear of the home. Um, it's siding. There was a front porch that was added with some um, living space that the owners have become very attached to on the front. And we've gone back and forth a bit and a little bit with Brittany, but amongst ourselves as well, trying to come up with a solution that's going to be sympathetic to the home, sympathetic to the neighborhood, but still allow the interior of the home and the exterior to work. Now, I want to say when we when we talk about, you know, trying to um, say it's a non-contributive structure, there's no intention ever to tear this thing down. In fact, any design we wanna do is going ideally be sympathetic to the design of the house. Um, the owners want to redo the front porch. Um, we also need to add some square footage to the home. Um, the owners are in need of another bedroom and a casual living space, and they have very, very little basement space that's usable. Um, and given the size of the addition that's already on the back of the home, we need to add a side addition. And um, we are aware that, um, you know, that that can be a challenge in historic neighborhoods. And also there are some challenges with that front porch space um, in trying to keep some of that usable space, but, but reflect the, the style and of the original of what might have been on the home. Um, so going back and forth with Brittany for a while, um, she suggested that we actually, you know, pursue what would happen if this house um, was, was declared um, not contributing. Um, so we're kind of going down that path um, to see what would happen in that case. Um, so, you know, and, and Brittany went through the, the, the seven character qualities of, of integrity. And, you know, we, I think we have, as the owners and the architect myself, we, have some questions about the design and the ability to return this house to its original kind of state ever, given the modifications that have been happening on the inside. Um, the whole back wall of the house is missing, the interior of the, has been changed. That front porch space is very integral with their living space at this point. Um, it's not as easy as just like ripping off the porch and the addition on the back and then saying, look, it's the original house again. Um, it's, it's a little simpler than just, just taking those pieces off. It's not as simple as taking those pieces off. Um, you know, as far as the material item too, um, I think that relates back to the workmanship item on that list of um, qualities. Um, you know, the siding is a, a vinyl siding um, and a majority, not a majority, but probably 30% of the house at this point is siding and no longer brick um, on the exterior. So um, I'd like to see if Kelly has anything to add, the owner. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, my additions really have to do, you know, with 
with keeping a lot of that square footage that has become additions. And it's not really about square foot footage. It's something we've discussed um, with staff uh, previously. We've had a lot of issues with security in our neighborhood and specifically with people trying to break into our house over the last, you know, we bought this house three years ago and we've been working with um, the landmark committee ever since then or, or staff of. Um, you know, we like to keep that front addition. We do see people coming up onto our porch regularly. Um, you know, the people who make it into our front yard versus who make it around to that side entrance is a very different um, number. So keeping that area, which is more of an entrance, so people can't just look into our home and, and things like that is a real um, issue for us. And then again, like we said, um, talking about just adding some square footage that makes it a usable space for our family um, off the side would be phenomenal. Um, yeah, and I think the only other thing really to say is the reasons that we're applying for non-contributing isn't that we don't think this, you know, doesn't have characteristics of a Denver Square. We'd like it to come back closer to characteristics of a Denver Square, as Sarah mentioned. Um, we are applying because we hate to go continuously go back and forth as we're trying to also apply for variances and other things, um, which we already, you know, we're already seeing with that uh front area we would have to apply for a variance to be able to keep that and then construct the porch again um, in a more historic manner um and other things so really what we're trying to do here is save everybody time and save myself a little bit of money um by moving forward in uh non-contributing status and that's all i have all right thank you are there any questions for the applicant Applicants, plural. I just have one question. Um, Sarah, you mentioned that at this point about 30% of the facade is now siding. Um, uh, yeah. Based on the photos, um, mm -hmm. are you referencing just the additions? It looks like the yeah, historic the, home still brick, right? Yeah, just the additions on the back. You can see there's a one story addition on part of it and then a two story addition on the back and then the front of it as well. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicants? No? All right. Thank you for your time and your patience today. No worries. Um, are there any uh, people on the line who wanted to provide a comment on this project? Please use the hand raise button at this time. I don't see any hands going up. So no. And Jen, is anybody still no. on the phone? Okay. Yeah, just, just online. Okay. All right, then let's move into, or Brittany, did you have some recap? Yeah, I just wanted um, to clarify the porch is currently, that enclosed space is currently violating setback. So any alterations to that porch space would require some type of variance of some sort. Um, we as Landmark can make recommendations to Board of Adjustment for historic structures. Um, and there are some administrative adjustments available as well for historic structures. If this house is determined non-historic, it would make it ineligible for the recommendations because it's to preserve the historic character of the neighborhood. Um, so I do, I, I have talked to the applicant significantly and I do understand a lot of the concerns, but I do have concerns that um, some of the work that we've talked about to the porch would potentially make them ineligible for adjustments or admin adjustments if this was declared non-historic. Thanks for clarifying that, that makes sense. Um, okay, uh, what did everybody think about how this meets um, section 30-111 of the Landmark Preservation Ordinance? So we're looking at, you know, I mean, Brittany did a good job of laying it out, um, the designation, Ordinance doesn't or application doesn't list whether this whether structures are contributing or non contributing, but this structure is in the period of significance, so it does meet B um, and C whether the structure or feature contributes to the significance of the structure or district in this case historic district. Um, and then it, the interpretation of the seven aspects of integrity. Kelly, maybe I'll jump in because I've had a lot of time to think about things here. <laughs> Great. Uh, no, just kidding. But um, yeah, I would say that you know I agree with staff's assessment here. I think that in spite of some of the changes that 
have happened over time, you know, window and, and door placements generally on primary and visible facades seem consistent with the exception of the front porch, but, you know, the um, front porch is something that can be reversed, even if it's maybe not easy or necessarily within the program, it's physically possible. I think the addition, even though it is large, is something contained behind the house that would just about meet our guidelines for an addition requirement, even for a, you know, a new project here. Um, and so I, you know, I think that you look at this house in the context of East Seventh Avenue, and you can tell that it was built with all of its neighbors with similar detailing, similar quality, and um, I think that the modifications that have been made on the inside gets back to the, you know, the body and soul conversation that we had on Larimer Square there for a bit, but unfortunately doesn't land in our purview with respect to this decision either. So um, I guess with that, yeah, I'm on board with staff's assessment here and and the, the contributing nature of this structure. I think that was well said, Graham. I'm, I'm in agreement with, with everything you just said. I, I looked at it and I go, oh, it's a four square that has a funky <laughs> porch <laughs> but you can tell it's it's a four square yeah. and to, to gary's point earlier too that the front porch you know of its own time yeah. 80s 90s may be an interesting study architecturally at some point in the future right but i'm i'm sure gary wants that to stay <laughs> <laughs> uh i have to uh, uh concur with with Brittany's assessment it's it's plain and simple at Denver Square with, uh, it's had work, but it is still readily identifiable as, as what it is and part of the uh, 7th Avenue, East 7th Avenue Historic District. So I would concur with, with Brittany's assessment as well. I just wanted to clarify for uh, the applicant and those listening in, because you guys can't see people who aren't speaking. Um, and Gary was laughing, smiling, and um, shaking his head about the wanting to keep the porch. So that, if you're worried about that down the line, that may not be an issue. Yeah, yeah, that was I that think was I should probably respond. I probably shouldn't have shook my head. I mean, I was, I've got, I guess I was wondering, um, if this district, when it was formed, because this this addition was in place at the time, uh, how the uh, significance would have been addressed, and um, uh, who knows? I mean, um, it's an interesting uh, aspect of uh, postmodern adaptations to historic buildings. Um, it's I wouldn't say it's extremely well done, but it's very interesting. Um, let's, um, let's just leave it as it appears to have been outside of the period of significance of the district. <laughs> so let's not, let's not go down that rabbit hole, but I hear what you're saying. <laughs> um, so I saw several nodding heads. Is everyone in agreement with the staff recommendation and assessment? All right, Gary, did you have something else to add? No. Okay. All right. Who's going to make the motion? I can. That's uh, Madam Chair. I uh, move to deny application 2022 COA 014 for the determination of non contributing status of 720 Downing Street to the East 7th Avenue Historic District. As per the seven qualities of integrity outlined in section 30-2 paragraph 11, character defining features of the East 7th Avenue Historic District presented testimony, submitted documentation and the information provided in the staff report. Thank you, George. Do we have a second? Second. I'll second. Um, thank you, Gary. I think you got that first. Brittany, did you have something to add? Yes. I, um, apologies, George read the motion absolutely correctly, but the COA number is uh, 2022 COA 349. Gotcha. So um, I'll make a friendly amendment to um, change the COA number to 2022-COA-349 in the motion. Do you accept, George? I'll accept. You bet. And, and Gary? Yes. Yes. Great. All right, if there's no further discussion on the motion, um, call for the vote, George. 
Aye. Graham? Aye. Gary? Aye. Larry? Aye. Erica? Aye. Kelly? Aye. All right, we have a unanimous vote and the motion passes. Next up, we have 2022-COA-350 at 3330 Alcott Street. Um, so our next application is um, for a dormer addition and a new basement courtyard with three doors on the south elevation, a new rear entry roof and pergola off of an existing addition and to um, reconstruct the existing front porch. This structure um, was constructed in 1890 and is within the period of significance um, for the Potter Highlands Historic District, which is prior to and including 1943. Um, so I'm gonna pause here on this slide for a little bit um, just to, to talk about um, the porch demolition. So the applicant is requesting to demolish the existing um, front porch and replace with a new porch. Um, that it will match the spindle, wood spindle columns that you see um, up on the uh, wall of the historic home. However, staff feel that this porch was constructed during the period of significance and is therefore a historic component that has um, gained historical significance in its own time. Um, and we do find that this porch should be preserved in its current form. While it is highly likely that originally this porch did have a completely wood uh, front porch with spindle columns that would have matched the architectural style of the home, it was very common in the 20s and 30s, particularly in the Potter Highlands Historic District to demolish those wood porches that had deteriorated and replace them with more solid um, brick porches of a craftsman style. Um, here in the office, we, we call it bungalized. Um, uh, so we do find that this porch is contributing to the history of this neighborhood and the development patterns of this neighborhood and are recommending that the um, front porch not be demolished as part of this application. Um, now that all being said, the applicant has indicated that this porch does have some structural issues and is pulling away slightly from the home. So there are some structural concerns um, for the front porch. Um, the applicant is also proposing to replace uh, non-historic windows on the home. Um, the window you see in this image here is the uh, window on the front of the home um, and it is a vinyl window. So we did not require window assessment for the replacement of the windows as they are um, vinyl windows and non-historic. So in terms of the alterations to the home, um, this home is uh, very small in footprint. It does have a small rear addition um, that was reviewed by staff um, administratively uh, not too long ago. And then several years ago, the commission did actually approve a very large side addition to this home. That approval has expired. Um, However, the applicant never moved forward with that approval. Um, and it's not something that we would likely allow today based on our design guideline update um, that it was done after the approval of that large um, two-story side addition. Um, so since that time, the applicant has um, reconsidered adding additional bedrooms to the home. And um, how they are proposing to do that now is actually dig out the basement of the home and all of the bedrooms will be located in the basement level. Um, because all of the bedrooms are located in the basement level, the applicant is proposing a large courtyard on the south side of the home and each basement will have egress um, through a pair of three French doors, um, which you can see in plan here. Um, the applicant is also proposing to demolish uh, 300 square feet of roofing to construct um, two dormers on the uh, north elevation or north roof slope and two dormers on the south roof slope, uh, which you can see in plan here. Um, this is only 32% demolition to the roof, so this would not trigger a public hearing. Um, however, the commission does find that the demolition of the front porch um, would 
be appropriate, it would actually need to go through a public hearing process because it's a front facade feature. And as Abby helpfully went over earlier today, any front facade feature does trigger that demolition public hearing when it's a historic element. And again, staff do find that to be a historic element. Um, so here is that south elevation um, that will be dug out to accommodate um, that those new basement uh, bedrooms. Um, staff has worked with the applicant as much as possible on this application um, to, uh, to minimize the impacts of this proposed um, basement dig out. I will say we don't have um, exceptionally good design guidelines to um, assess a change of this nature. Um, so it was difficult to, uh, to assess. Um, Guideline 2.27 says states maintain and repair original foundations. And G is do not install windows and window wells on street facing facades of an original foundation. New windows and window wells may sometimes be appropriate on non-primary facades. So no new window wells will be installed on the primary elevation. The new courtyard will be on the south elevation um, into the existing foundation. And the applicant is um, proposing um, the large egress doors so that they can have natural light and also um, you can safely exit the bedroom space into the courtyard. Um, we do feel that this is a non-traditional addition um, and it is mostly below grade. Um, and typically below grade things are not within the purview of the Landmark Preservation Commission, um, but the applicant is proposing a smooth finish stucco on the foundation wall that will be exposed as part of this new basement dig out. They have significantly revised the design of the doors to be compatible with our um, requirements on uh, openings. Um, so they have simplified the doors to these just simple French doors. The doors will have a metal canopy awning um, over above this element, um, which you can kind of see in this uh, this elevation here, and then the awning example, um, the applicant did lower that on the building facade to make it as minimally visible as possible. And then the entirety of the courtyard addition will be concealed behind an existing site fence. Um, so while this is a very atypical and addition, we do feel that it's an innovative solution to adding additional square footage to the home. Um, additionally, an addition of this nature does not require um, R&O review. However, as staff was very concerned about the nature of this addition, we did ask the applicant to um, reach out to the R&O, and the R&O is also supporting this addition. Um, here you can see the dormer additions um, on the south roof slope. The ones on the north roof slope are exactly the same. Um, these are inset from the wall plane um, and they will tie into the ridge line of the roof, but as they are gable roof dormers and they are tying into a gable roof form, um, we do feel that this is subordinate and appropriate and is not overwhelming um, the roof of the structure. Um, and then you can also see that proposed um, covered entry that will be added on to the existing um, addition that is clad in lap siding. Uh, windows on this elevation um, are also proposed to be replaced. They are vinyl windows. Um, our biggest concern about the way that the windows are represented in the drawings is that you can clearly see in the photographs of the home that the window openings are arched openings and on the elevation drawings they're just shown as square openings. Um, so we would like the applicant to confirm that the windows will fit within the original openings because it does appear that even though the window itself is vinyl, much of the original wood trim and sash um, elements are still intact. So we would like those preserved. <clears throat> um, there will also be a pergola structure constructed off the rear of the home. Um, it is constructed out of wood and is not visible from the public right away. Um, again, those dormer additions on the north elevation, which are very similar to the dormer additions on the south elevation. Um, the courtyard is proposed to be terraced to kind of mitigate some of that um, dig out and 
it is proposed to be naturally landscaped um, with uh, this stone material that you see here on this image um, here. So all the materials that are proposed for the um, basement dig out and dormer additions are high quality materials um, and generally staff are supportive of this approach with the condition that um, the front porch not be demolished and replaced with a replica front porch um, because the porch that is there now, while not the original porch, is part of the history of the home. And then clarify window opening design and plan on the historic structure. Um, so that just essentially means accurately showing the window openings and elevation. Great. Thanks, Brittany. Are there any questions for staff? Yeah, Larry. Yeah, um, I just wanted to kind of know, Brittany, um, is there, I guess, how certain uh, is the staff of the fact that the porch was built during the period of significance? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> I would say based on the um, architectural detailing of the porch, uh, it does look very um, 1940s in style, just based on the brick materials, um, the way the columns are articulated, the stone sill on, um, on the, the, the porch is very characteristic of some of these bungle, bung, bungle bungalow style porches that you see in the Potter Highlands historic district. Um, so I don't, I'm not, I can't say I have evidence specifically that this was in the 20s and 30s, but this is a general development pattern that you see um, in the Potter Highlands historic district. There are some neighborhoods that this is a very typical development pattern. Baker is one, as you're aware, um, as you still live there. And then Potter Highlands is also the, uh, one of those other districts that you do see a lot of those, um, this, this bungalow style porch added on to the structures. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? All right, let's hear from the applicants. Um, you can, again, thank you so much for your patience. I know it's been a really long haul. Um, so, Unmute yourself when you're ready, and please start with your name and address. Hi, I'm Julie Spinato. I also live in the Potter Highlands at 2745 uh, West 36 Ave in Denver. Um, I'm the architect for the project. Is Andrew on as unmuted? I, I yeah. just feel yes. like the owner has more information about the repairs that need to be done for the front porch um it, his he he believes this sewer line is underneath there and needs to be kind of rebuilt and so that was one of the one of the reasons that he wanted to rebuild the front porch and jen yeah. if you could pause it real quick i do have andrew's presentation if you want to pull that up i have it it's sorry i totally <laughs> forgot that, that there was another one let me close that one um come on where are you? There you go. All right. Hold on a second, Andrew. I'm going to reset because that my bad. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. This is uh, Andrew Vermouth. I live at 3330 Alcott Street. I'm the owner here. I've been here since 2009. And as Brittany mentioned, uh, thank you, Brittany, for that comprehensive description. Um, we We did have a project that went through the commission in late 2014 did, did not go through with that project. This aspect, the porch aspect was part of that project and it did pass the commission as um, uh, for two reasons. One, this structural problem that the brick wall is, is coming away from the, the slab and the, the slab is sinking. Um, and the fact that we, uh, as part of the project, the, we have to replace the sewer line, uh, which now goes uh, from the east, uh, which is the back of the house, turns 90 degrees and then 90 degrees again, and goes along the south side of the house, south facade, all the way to the, the front 
of the house to out to Alcott Street. Uh, so it, it kind of basically turns 180 degrees. And that sewer line is in the way of the this uh, it's about three feet away from the the south uh, side of the building. Uh, so it conflicts with this whole um, e egress of the you know the the doors in the court courtyard. Um, it's also uh, really problematic that it it was built this way. Um, it doesn't work very well, and uh, as part of the project, we just we need to replace the sewer line. So that sewer line now would go uh, under the the north side of the house, inside okay. the house, out, Denver and line. essentially under this what what the porch where the porch is now and ties in to the yard and goes out to the the street in a much straighter line. Uh, so that's the other reason that this porch, at least the slab, has to be uh, taken out and replaced. Um, so what we wanted to do is is um, replace it with, you know, what 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 uh, we presume existed before, with which was these spindles, um, like we see, you know, examples of all over the neighborhood, uh, and and even keep the roof of the of the house of the porch intact uh so those are the two reasons um that we need to demolish the porch or the at least the slab so that that other picture you're seeing now is the shadow of the original spindle that on that uh, north side of the door that matches the the spindle on the south side that's still there uh, so what we wanted to do is is um construct new spindles that are exactly like those and put two new spindles on the front of the porch instead of these heavy columns, brick columns that are there. And I, I will say, I think um, it, to me, it looks like the, the porch was probably constructed, the, to, the brick looks like it's from the, the late 50s or 60s, but I can't be sure of that. So. Those are those are the reasons that we want to and need to at least demolish the porch uh, as part of the project. And not sure, you know, how to proceed um, with rebuilding it um, after this demolition. That's it. Great. Uh Julie, did you have anything to add? Um, not in regards to the porch. I think Andrew covered the bases there. Um, I do want to say that when we do replace those windows that Brittany had mentioned, and um, that we will keep those curved headers. Um, and also, thank you, Brittany, for your great summary. I don't have anything else to add, I don't think. All right. Thank you both for your time. Uh, are there any questions for the applicants? Yeah, Gary. Um, I'm wondering if there's been any investigation as to how deep the existing footings are to the building uh, based on the, you know, the proposed digging out of the crawl space um, and how that might impact um, the plan. I mean, the plans that are presented uh, appear to assume that uh, all the footings are deep enough to do what you're planning to do, or you're planning to do underpinning all the way around the building, which could have a big impact even on the front porch. Um, we are planning on doing, you know, we're, we're working with the engineer now. We have stopped while we go through this process, um, but they seem to be confident. You know, I. Um, that they can, you know, either, I th I, I'm showing a furred out wall down there. I think they're, they're thinking they could, um, you know, get it either, get the new footer either flush with the existing wall or with just like a four inch bump out down there. They, they've done this kind of thing before. So I, I'm sure once we get into it, we'll have to go back and forth with their detailing, but obviously our 
a hundred percent goal is to not affect the integrity of the house in doing so. And um, if we have to pull the wall in a bit on the interior, we'll have to deal with that um, with interior changes as we go along. I'd probably add a little to that, um, just saying that part of the the intent of this uh, dig out is to uh, enhance and strengthen the structure of the foundation and because uh, the, the the house is sinking very slowly to the south and uh, um, we want to strengthen the whole foundation to to perpetuate the house the, the integrity of the structure yeah it's it's pretty certain that that entire courtyard area will be a, a whole new wall so that at a minimum will help with that all right thank you gary does that address your question are there any other questions for the applicants no all right thank you so much for your time today is there anyone on the line who has a comment on this project please use the hand raise button if you do I don't see any hands being raised. All right. Yeah, Brittany. Um, so th with the uh, side two-story addition, the porch um, was definitely part of that project. It was definitely approved by the commission. Again, that approval has expired. We have new and different design guidelines. Um, so I think it'd be a worthwhile conversation for the commission if you feel that the porch was constructed in the period of significance, if you think it's historic to the home and contributing um, and whether or not you would allow its demolition. All right, great. Thanks, Brittany. Um, with that, let's let's just start a deliberation on the porch then. Um, exactly how Brittany had framed it. Um, you know, thoughts as to whether this may be contributing to the period of significance, um, which I believe ends at 1943. Yeah, prior to and including 1943 is the district's period of significance. Yeah, Larry. Since, yeah, since I kind of brought up the question about the certainty of that, um, I'll start out. I, I guess what I feel about it is that it clearly isn't, you know, original to the, the building. Um, and because although it is very, very possible that it's within the uh, period of historic significance, but we aren't 100% sure of that, then I'm inclined to give the applicant the benefit of the doubt in that case. Um, and, and, and I would be supportive of, of per what they have uh, presented, uh, redoing the porch. Thanks, Larry. Erica. Um, so I'd like to say that, I, you know, I, putting aside the question of constructed during the period of significance, I am not entirely convinced that um, the porch that they're suggesting would have been what was there originally. I know they're talking about matching the spindles, but I don't think the roof form, that shed roof, is likely to have been the roof form that used those spindles. So, um, you know, I think it was likely either a flat roof or a very shallow hit, you know, side hit roof um, given other houses that are just like this. And so on top of, you know, possibly removing something that's from the period of significance, I do have concerns about basically having an amalgamation of two features that are a porch that has two different types of features that never existed historically. Um, so that's kind of my biggest issue with the porch. Good point. Other thoughts on the porch? Gary? Um, well, first of all, I think Erica makes an excellent point because I have suspicions as well that just removing the masonry and replacing it with Victorian woodwork is uh, consistent with our guidelines, unless there's 
significant research in trying to establish what was there originally. And the other thing is, I can't quite tell from the photographs, but is those um, asbestos diagonal shingles on the porch? Um, it's a little hard to tell. They don't appear to be um, asphalt shingles. And I'm, you know, that could also lend greater credibility that this was done in the, during the period of significance. Although it's, you know, could go a few years either way. It's still a educated guess. I think those are asphalt shingles that are just, it's just a hard, uh, a slightly blurry picture. So you think, you think that those are um, like a three tab shingle, it's not diagonal, they're, they're not? Yes, because no one else can see my head it, nodding. It looks like I'm in the sure bottom left tab. photo, it looks like it's not diagonal on this screen. But I do agree that in the bottom right photo, that does look like an interesting perspective and it almost appears diagonal there. But I mean, it seems hard to believe that they haven't had to redo the roof in that amount of time. I mean, <laughs> Well, if they were asbestos shingles, it's like it's possible that they'd be original, but I, I'll agree that the, it's probably not. They're definitely three tab looking at a different view of it. So, um, yeah, and I just looked up the permit. They got a permit for re-roofing in 2020 and it was um, inspected and, and approved, so. Good. Yeah. So this is an interesting conversation and um, I tend to, I was kind of in agreement with Larry where it's like, well, if we don't really know the time period, but Erica, I see what you're saying, which is, you know, even, even if they were to remove that porch, just putting that shed roof back on doesn't seem historically appropriate. So um, am I, is, is that kind of the direction most um, agree with that maybe there is flexibility to remove the porch given the date is, the exact date of construction is unknown, um, but that maybe the proposed porch isn't necessarily a compatible or appropriate porch for the um, time period? If, might I suggest that if, if, we, um, if we make the uh, motion as suggested and leave the uh, replacement of the porch excluded, um, and as they do more research, they can come back at some point in time, mm -hmm. the proposal to either repair the porch because it's gonna need that or to replace the porch with something that is well-researched and compatible with the character of the building. Yeah. Just by, sorry, go ahead, Graham. Oh no, I was just gonna jump in and say, I think I agree with Gary if we, you know, it seems like our previous project we looked at the front porch was very clearly outside of the period of significance here, you know, you know it's, it's um, guilty until proven innocent or innocent until proven guilty, right? We're, we're trying to choose which direction to approach here. And I think without um, a really firm establishment that the porch is outside of that period makes it hard to give a, you know, a direct or very concrete answer here. Uh, I think, you know, if, if constructability concerns or repairs to the porch, as the applicant mentioned, are also part of that, that it's helpful information, but it doesn't necessarily justify the removal of the porch. You know, sewer lines could be pipe burst or things like that underneath if you know, there's alternate installation methods. I know we've looked at a number of porches where demolition and reconstruction in an existing form to correct structural deficiencies or other things like that have been approved, but typically that's in the light of trying to maintain these character defining features. Uh, and so I think staffs, um, you know, analysis of bungalizing, um, as, as Brittany mentioned, you know, is an accurate historic context, especially for this historic district. Um, and so uh, I guess for all those reasons, I, I'd be inclined to, as Gary said, kind of keep it this way. And, and if the application is able to provide alternate information um, or additional um, justification there, that, that that would be helpful or just revise the design in, in general. Right. Yep, absolutely. Um, 
I mean, because what we do know is there are wood spindles. So um, we know that that was there historically. There's the ghost marks and there's one remaining. So yeah, uh, okay. I, I would, is everyone in agreement that with the porch kind of leaving the condition as proposed by staff and then it allows the flexibility for the applicant to um, come back with a different proposal there, whether it's giving more information or um, revising the design. Kind of shake your head yes if you're on board with that approach. Yeah. Vis a vis the porch, yes. Yeah, okay. So that, so we're all on board with the porch. Everyone nodded their head yes. Um, George, did you have something else? To I just have to compliment the architect and the owner for coming up with a design that does not plop a three-car garage on top of a little bungalow. Mm -hmm. um, to Gary's concern, if the foundation uh, can support it or can be made to uh, support it, I just think that's a great idea for adding space with, with, uh, without you know having huge impacts on the rest of the uh, uh, the neighborhood. Uh, guidelines. So, amen. To work with the porch. Yes, we, we'd <laughs> like to work with the porch in, in, uh, in maybe some different designs right. or whatever. It's got to come out anyway, or at yeah. least the slab has to be demolished anyway to move the sewer line. So, um, but well, as soon as I saw this, <laughs> well, that, that there's a, a really creative and to me acceptable way of maintaining the rhythm and flow of the neighborhood and, and getting more space. So I right. hope they're successful with it. I agree. Does everyone agree that the modifications at the site and the basement um, are appropriate and meet the guidelines given they're not visible from the right away? So yeah, I agree. Uh, thanks George for mentioning that. Good. Uh, and then the last element I think to discuss is the dormers. Um, I, I agree with staff's assessment that they uh, are are appropriate and meet the guidelines. Does everyone agree? See nodding heads. So, okay, so we're all in agreement with that. And um, staff did recommend the condition of clarifying the window opening design, um, which the applicant has already done verbally. Um, so I'm sure that they won't have an issue um, just updating the drawings to to reflect that and getting that back to staff. So that seems like an appropriate thing to leave in the motion. All right, who's gonna make the motion? I can make the motion. Thank you, Erica. I move to conditionally approve application number 2022-COA-350 for the dormer addition, basement dig out and rear yard site work at 3330 Alcott Street as per design guidelines 2.14, 2.20, 2.24, 2.26, 2.27, 2.29, 3.2, 4.6, 521, character defining features for the Potter Highlands Historic District, presented testimony, submitted documentation and information provided in the staff report with the following conditions. One, do not demolish the front porch and replace with the replica porch. And two, clarify window opening design in plan on the historic structure. Thanks, Erica. Do we have a second? Second. Thanks, George. All right, I'll call for the vote. George. Aye. Graham. Aye. Gary. Aye. Larry. Aye. Erica. Aye. And Kelly, aye. All right, we have a unanimous vote and the motion passes. So the project is conditionally approved. All right, our last project for design review today is 2022-COA-341 at 3449 Elliott Street. Crystal, go ahead. Great, thanks, Kelly. Uh, just get this here, great. So this is for 3449 North Elliott Street. The applicant is proposing to demolish an existing one-story garage and construct a new detached garage and accessory dwelling unit. Uh, the property is located in the Potter Highlands Historic District. 
and the proposed ADU garage will be located at the rear of the zone lot along the alley. Uh, the proposed garage ADU is approximately 36 feet wide. Um, though the primary structure is a two-story structure, it is approximately 24 feet wide, uh, meaning that the new ADU garage will extend past both sides of the primary house as seen on the site plan. Additionally, the massing of the garage ADU is very large, uh, is not subordinate to the primary stu structure or the surrounding context. There we go. So here we can see the proposed ADU garage floor plans. Uh, on the first floor plan on the left, you can see the two car garage for the primary structure and the one car garage for the ADU. And on that second floor, you can see that two bedroom ADU that's proposed. So here are the elevations for that ADU garage. Uh, the form and roof shape of the new ADU garage is compatible with the primary structure, though projecting, projecting bays on garages is not common to the district. Uh, per design guideline 4.6E uh, states to avoid using a wide range of building materials when, um, in, when building in the surrounding historic context, use a simple combination of materials. The structure will utilize three different siding materials, including a brick veneer, a three-coat stucco, and shake shingles siding in the gable ends. A simplified combination of materials would be more characteristic of the district. Uh, additionally, many of the manufacturer specifications for these materials were not provided as noted in the staff report. Uh, per design guideline 4.3, which states to design a building to include typical features and rhythms of historic buildings in the surrounding context block using similar proportions and dimensions. Uh, the proposed garage ADU structure does not include typical features and rhythms of historic buildings in the surrounding context, particularly the scaling elements and articulation does not match the surrounding context. Uh, the belt course and brick at the base of the structure at the east, west, and south elevations is proposed to be seven feet in height which is not characteristic of contributing structures in the district and seems overly tall on the structure. Additionally, the north and south side elevations do not show brick being used at the base and the finishing at the corners is unclear and would likely abruptly end, which is not common to the district. Uh, design guideline 4.8 states that des to design windows, doors, and other features to be compatible with the original primary structure and the historic context. Uh, the garage ADU will feature individual windows with trim surrounds, uh, double hung fiberglass windows at the east and west elevations, and other smaller windows at the north and south elevations. Uh, dimensions for the windows are not shown on the plans, nor were window specifications or details provided, so proportions and operations are unclear. Uh, windows appear to be multi-light at the east and west elevations with other multi-light patterns at the north and south elevations. The primary structure appears to have mostly simple one over one windows at the front facade, as do most other houses in the district. Uh, so window patterns should be simplified to better fit the district and the surrounding context. So here in the upper photo, you can see 3449 Elliott Street from the corner of West 35th and Elliott. Uh, the proposed garage ADU will, will, will be located behind the two-story home seen here. On the bottom is a view of West 35th Avenue looking down the alley toward the new location of the garage ADU. In context to adjacent structures, only one height was provided by the applicant for the garage located at 3445 Elliott Street. Uh, which stands at 15 feet tall. The 2908 to 2912 West 35th Avenue on the other adjacent side of the property, which you can see here at the bottom along West 35th Avenue, appears to stand at a similar height, though no actual height was provided. Additionally, this property has a flat parking area along the alley, which allows for a more visible public right-of-way view of this new uh, secondary structure. 
Additionally, most secondary structures in this district are one to one and a half stories in height and are brick construction per the character defining features for the Potter Highlands. So here are some isometric views from the application showing the proposed garage ADU. The new structure will be very visible from West 35th Avenue, which is a side street and the alley impacting the character of the street and the alley. The secondary structure does not appear to be within the range seen in the surrounding context. The overall mass scene with the height of the garage ADU is very large, is not subordinate to the primary structure or the surrounding context. Additionally, the structure does not meet design guidelines 4.3, 4.6, 4.8, and 4.19. Therefore, staff is recommending denial. Thanks, Crystal. Are there any questions for staff? Nope. Um, I just have one question. Crystal, do you know, and I apologize if I'm if I miss this, but the garage doors, so are they the design as shown in the elevation? Because there's there's a whole product brochure attached and nothing's circled on it. And so sometimes I know it's just a representation in the drawing and okay. I'm but I mean, the rendering is showing it that way. So yeah, the okay. applicant didn't circle materials for the ones that were provided. So you can ask the applicant. Okay, great. All right. Any other questions for staff? All right. Um, it looks like the applicants joined us. Thank you so much for your patience today. Um, Please start with your name and address and unmute when you're ready. Yeah, hi there. Um, I'm Matt Udaly. I'm uh, <clears throat> the designer of the ADU here at 3449 Elliott Street. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, it's been a long day. I feel like I know you all very well now. I've been here since one. So anyhow, uh, yes, we proposed the ADU and I understand the size is larger than uh, Crystal has, you know, mentioned that it needs to be. However, technically it is still considered a one and a half story building. And I'm designing it in accordance with obviously Denver's zoning codes. So it is technically a one and a half story building. Um, we would like it this large because the homeowner has a large family and proposes to use it as an ADU for his immediate family. And he also has a lot of noise coming off of federal. So utilizing the width would be beneficial for that as well. Uh, we originally proposed a board and batten system, but that didn't seem to be like a great idea through the landmark. So we changed it to stucco. And unfortunately, the renderings do not show where fences will be constructed. So we'll have six foot cedar fences at the corners. Um, so the brick not wrapping a corner shouldn't be an issue uh, from the street view or from the alley view. Um, we did have decent approval, I think, from the, uh, the RNO, the, <clears throat> the, res the, the neighborhood district. Uh, making a few adjustments, which I did. So the windows on the front, which is the west elevation, and the east pretty much match exactly what's on the house currently. I didn't provide a window schedule as of yet, just since we're in the you know conceptual design phase here. Um, some of the windows with the lights match the one out front on the existing house. So we did try to take that into consideration. Uh, the one up top in the dormer end. There you go. So we are trying to complement the house and improve the area as well. I do understand it will be considerably visible from 35th. Um, but as you can see on that house on the corner, that's really not an historic home um, that conforms with any of the Potter Highlands design guidelines, if you will. And I will say the coloring of the green does not look good on the renderings on the screen, but it was <laughs> matched the existing house. Uh, that's about all I have. 
All right, thank you. Uh, are there any questions for the applicant? I'll just pose my question about the garage doors. Um, I, I assume that the style that you're going for is accurately represented in the elevations and the renderings. Is that the door yes, type? Correct. Okay. Correct. And in the renderings, um, oh, great. You've got the materials up here. Perfect. Um, so in the renderings, like you said, the green looks a little bit brighter. Um, and here on, and I think the red did as well. Is the red more accurately this darker maroon? Yeah, it's more of a maroon color on the trim. The brick, we're going to obviously try to match as close as possible to the house, uh, which is sometimes challenging. And I did not specify manufacturer or anything like that since I'm not sure exactly where to research that quite yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, if we're going to be denied altogether, you know, as staff has recommended numerous times, then I don't see the point in getting that detailed here mm -hmm. okay and so the fiberglass since the windows are fiberglass that color would be integral right correct okay um the reason we kind of went with this design was to try to stay with the time period of you know it's it's one of those um houses with the larger alleys in the back which probably could have acted as a carriage house for you know, the little buggage and carries and carriage and uh, things along that nature. So I don't want to call it necessarily barn style design, even though that's originally what we went with. Um, we've kind of tried to simplify it a little bit more and make it try to blend in a little bit better. All right. Any other questions for the applicant? No. Nope. All right. Thanks for your time. Is there anyone on the line? Um, who wanted to provide a comment on this project? Use the hand raise button. I don't see any hands raised. Okay. Um, all right. So let's move into, unless there's any recap, Crystal. Nope. Okay. We'll move into deliberation then. So uh, what did everybody think about how this um, ADU um, compares to the guidelines? Um, I agree totally with Crystal. I don't think the structure is subordinate. I don't think it matters whether or not the house on the corner uh, is of historic design or uh, this is going to tower over it. And uh, we have se we've seen this before where it looks like a whole second house as opposed to uh, an ADU, and it is, it's not subordinate, and it is just, just too massive, I think, for, uh, for an ADU, for the lot, for the neighborhood. That's my All assessment right. of, of that. Thanks, George. Graham, I think you had unmuted as well. What were you going to? chime in with you bet no I, I mean i think again uh also agree with the staff report guideline 4.19 that talks about a new garage or secondary structure to be compatible with and subordinate to the primary structure but also the historic context uh i, I kept coming back to one of the the renderings it's the exterior rendering from the west side and it, I, I couldn't shake the the center yeah center bottom um it, it so closely resembled um a form that I would maybe more associate with like the modern suburban, you know, projecting garage, if you were to take the third garage door and create a front porch entry and, and reconciling that with the, you know, kind of urban, more vertical as opposed to horizontal nature of the Potter Highlands district, that specific guideline in the context, uh, I think was, was um, one component of the staff's report that really resonated with me. So but in general, agree with the staff's report. I, I think the steps the applicant has taken to try and pull cues from the house and other things are appreciated, but in the size and, and kind of the general massing here um, feels like it could respond more to, to the Potter Highlands district. Thanks, Graham. 
I, I'll just add that I agree um, with the staff report and with um, how Graham summed it up. I think 4.19 is, I agree with um, how that uh, spoke to him. It did the same to me. Um, I would also just add that I think the um, mix of materials, um, it was also particularly problematic in, in meeting the design guidelines that, that these, um, the bricks, stucco and shingles um, all together was um, not compatible with what we we're seeing in the historic district and um, just too, too many materials at once, so. Thanks, Erica. Um, I would agree with what's been said. I, I don't know, the materials, like in one sense, I feel like maybe if that brick came down in height that maybe it wouldn't be quite as big of a problem to have all three. Um, but I, I think what's really uh, the issue I'm having is the subordinate. Uh, I just don't think it's subordinate um, as, as George and Graham and every, everybody has mentioned. Uh, and then the windows, I, also, I understand now uh, where the applicant was coming from that he was using inspiration from that dormer on the front uh, facade to have the divided lights. But um, I think that that's you know, kind of an accent window on the primary structure and not the typical window. So to have all of these windows have divided lights in the upper sash or the entire window, just seemed a little fussy to me. It, it draws even more attention. And typically in our secondary structures, we want them to be more simplified. Uh, so that was just one more thing I thought I'd point out. Hi, Gary. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, it's, it's not, I agree with the staff report. Um, and I, you know, I think, Part of the problem with it seemingly to be too large is that it really pushes the boundaries of a story and a half house or a story and a half building. So, you know, I don't, I'm not the zoning guy, but I don't know how this would fit into a story and a half envelope. And I think that has to do with how the gable ends are treated. It just reads as a two story house with like lean to additions. Um, uh, and I agree with the staff's comments about materials and design and context. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, I agree as well with what everybody has said. All right, um, then it sounds like it's unanimous and um, hopefully there was enough provided in the staff report and in our deliberation to help um, the applicant come up with a uh, a new solution, you can work with staff to do so. Um, who's gonna make the motion? I can make the motion. Okay, okay Thanks, go ahead. Graham. Sounds good. Um, I move to deny application number 2022-COA-341 for the ADU at 3449 Elliott Street. As per presented testimony, submitted documentation, guidelines 4.3, 4.6, 4.8, 4.19, the Potter Highlands character defining features, presented testimony, submitted documentation, and information provided in the staff report. Thank you, Graham. Second. Thank you, George. All right, I will call for the vote, George. Sec uh, aye. <laughs> Thank you. Graham. In late, aye. Gary. Aye. Larry. Aye. Erica. Aye. And Kelly, I, all right, um, unanimous vote. So the motion passes and the application is denied. All right, that was our last design review project on today's agenda. Only 536 guys, I mean, well done. All right, we unfortunately have more on the agenda. So there are business items. <laughs> uh, so, you can see the process on the screen. If there's anyone from the public joining us today, um, we will provide public comment periods for the business items. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce the item, staff will introduce it, and then we'll open it up for comment and 
commission will deliberate. So the first step today is the policy for applicant presentations to the Landmark Preservation Commission. Um, so I'm not sure, Brittany or Jen, who's taken this one? It's me, Brittany. Um, yeah. So uh, we have an update for the applicant presentation policy. Um, the LPC adopted this in 2010, um, which you may recognize is 12 years ago. Um, so we felt like it was time to do an update to the policy um, to address um, kind of some some in-person virtual um, op options that are happening now once we go back in person in September, um, and just to provide a little additional clarity and simplify it. Um, additionally, the LPC and LDDRC um, applicant presentation policy was together, so we have separated those out. So the LDDRC has their own application presentation policy and the LPC will have um, your own application presentation policy. It's not really um, a change to any of the things that we have previously required. Um, we've always required applicants submit any additional PowerPoint presentation materials one week prior to the commission meeting. Um, let us know if there are any um, materials that they need to set up in person. Um, we encourage no um, computers be used because we are on the city's network and don't want to inf interfere with um, technology services and making sure our network is secure. Um, so it's really no change to the existing policy. It will just be in a new format that is our new um, policy format and is not from 2010. And also addresses hybrid and hybrid meetings. Great. Um, are there any questions for staff? Nope. Seems pretty consistent with what we're doing. So looks great. <laughs> um, all right. Are public there any comment? public comments? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't see any hands raised. I don't think we have a hand raised. Do we have button. anyone? No, we don't have a hand raised sheet, but people have been on the call the whole time. So no, yeah. no hands so, raised. Okay. All right. Um, if there's no public comment, let's move into deliberation. Um, everyone, everyone okay with this? <laughs> Formalizing this policy? All right, great. Then who's gonna make the motion? I can make the motion. Thanks, Graham. I move to approve the policy application. Uh, I move to approve the policy for applicant presentations to the Landmark Preservation Commission. All right, do we have a second? A second. Thanks, Erica. All right, let's vote. George. Aye. Graham. Aye. Gary. Aye. Larry. Aye. Erica. Aye. Kelly. Aye. All right, unanimous vote. So it's approved. Um, our next business item today is um, the draft policy for public comment. So this is a policy that was initially adopted by the commission in 2015 um, and updated in 2016. Um, we as staff felt like there needed to be some clarity to this document as the wording was um, slightly confusing. Um, so we have changed some of the way the, the this document is worded, but the deadlines remain the same um, for uh, written public comment to the commission. So who received written public comment um, before 5 p.m. 11 calendar days um, to, prior to the meeting, we will provide that as part of the materials we post on the website. Um, we'll continue to accept public comment up until noon uh, the day prior to the meeting and we'll email that to you as the commission. Um, but afternoon on the day prior to the meeting, uh, we will no longer accept um, any more public comment and applicants or interested parties are expected to attend in person. Um, so that just outlines uh, how much time 
is allowed for the general public comment period, the public hearing comment period, the consent agenda, um, and the design review. Um, it will also link back to the policy that you just approved. Um, so this is more similar to the formatting of planning board. And then it also has some frequently asked questions, which is similar to the formatting of city council's public comment policy. Um, just uh, how do you sign up for the meeting? What information do you need to provide? how a speaker order determined, um, how many times you can speak about projects, um, if everyone will get to speak, and if you'll get a response back from the commission. Um, so this will also, um, this is just some clarity to some of the, what we as staff found is confusing terminology in our current policy and some new frequently asked questions. Great, any questions for staff? I just have one question on this and I don't know whether it's valid or not, but um, because you do reference applicant presentation and referring back to that. Uh, mm -hmm. However, we have had in, in some meetings prior people try who are part of the applicant team but aren't mm -hmm. speaking during the 10 minutes, try to provide a comment during the public comment period. Um, wasn't sure if that's like a note that should be added that if you're on the applicant team owner architect contractor engineer like whatever family member like um then you can't provide public comment um sure we could update it for that it does say on the applicant presentation all applicant property owners and their represent or representatives have a total of 10 minutes to present per design okay. review item. Um, so, so I mean, maybe that's, there. yeah, maybe that's enough. It doesn't happen frequently, but it has mm -hmm. happened multiple times since I've been on the commission, you know? Um, so I, th I think that's fine. That answers my question. It's, it's elsewhere. All right, any other questions? Okay, uh, are there any public comments? please raise your hand. I don't see any hands raised. No public comments on the policy for public comment. <laughs> All right, well. <laughs> we do have two members of the public attending. That, that was your time, guys. Okay, um, if there are no public comments, let's deliberate. Um, again, this is pretty consistent with what's already in place. Any concerns? shaking no so everybody is okay with the policy all right then uh, who's going to make the motion i'll go ahead uh i move to approve the policy for public comment to the landmark preservation commission thank you larry we have a second all right thanks graham let's vote george aye graham aye <laughs> gary Aye. Larry. Aye. Erica. Aye. Kelly. Aye. All right. It's approved. Unanimous vote. Um, okay. So next up for business items, uh, we have the East High School at 1600 City Park Esplanade or 1545 Detroit Street. Um, and this is to amend the National Register nomination. Kara. Hello, thank you for sticking around here. I will speak. My thank way you to for sticking around. <laughs> um, so we have three designations, three national register nominations that um, we are um, tasked with commenting on. So landmark preservation staff, we reviewed it and provided our recommendations. So for the East High School, it's an amendment to an already existing designation application. The application currently talks about the um, importance of East High School's Black population within its historic context, but it does not specifically call it out as a area of significance. Um, and so this uh, amendment is specifically calling it out. It's under what is known in um, National Register language as ethnic heritage African-American. That's just the area of significance as this was written quite some time ago, or that, that the area of significance was noted a while ago. Um, it is also raising it from a local level to a state level of significance, specifically around the 1973 Supreme Court case, 
keys versus the school district number one and the busing and integration that was um, done in East High School. And so uh, we are recommending that you recommend that it's forwarded to the keeper. Um, uh, just a note that CLG drafts are um, submitted earlier than others. So in all three of these, there's some typos and some changes that we recommend being updated um, before it's actually approved um, or sent to um, the keeper. But it's somewhat normal to have these kind of typos in that. And Erica, I see, is nodding her head. So we are recommending that you recommend that it gets forwarded to the keeper. Great. Thanks, Kara. Any questions for staff? All right. Are there any public comments? Please use the hand raise button. I don't see any hands raised. All right. Um, then let's move into deliberation. Um, does everyone, after reviewing this, does everyone agree with the amendments proposed? I see nodding heads, yes. Absolutely. What took it so long? <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Um, well, we won't spend any more time on it then. If everybody's in consensus, who's going to make the motion? I'll make the motion. Uh, I move to recommend that the National Register Amendment for the East High School at 1600 City Park Esplanade or 1545 Detroit, Detroit Street be forwarded to the keeper of the National Register of Historic Places with the recommended edits to correct typos and minor clarifications per presented testimony, submitted documentation, and information provided in the staff report. Thanks, Erica. Second. Thanks, Gary, for seconding. All right, um, I'll call for the vote. George. Aye. Graham. Aye. Gary. Aye. Larry. Aye. Erica. Aye. Kelly. Aye. All right. Unanimous vote and the motion passes. Um, all right. And so, next, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> Kelly. I just didn't have to go forward. I'm sorry. It's fine. Um, I do just need to uh, voice that the Emily Griffith Opportunity School is a client of my firm. I have not worked on the project. Um, I'm not sure if I should recuse myself for this. We, we did not write the nomination, but um, a coworker of mine was involved in the recent reno renovation. Um, I'll go ahead and recuse myself, but the, the thing is that just makes you guys have to elect a chair. <laughs> it's just a lot. I mean, I think I can make a non-biased judgment, but Adam, is that is that okay? Yeah, this is a recommendation to the state. Is that right, Kara, or the feds or someone? So I, I think it's totally fine. Okay. All right. Then, then I'll then I'll not go through the fuss of having to recuse. I mean, I I don't have any involvement, but I just wanted to voice that. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. Then Thank Kira, you. go for it. Yeah, and sorry for me trying to speed through it. So um, this, like the other two, are um, already Denver landmarks. Uh, so this is significant under criteria A, B, and C, which is. Um, uh, history, uh, person, and architecture. Um, on this one, uh, it is recommended as being uh, eligible at the state level, and staff felt that there wasn't sufficient information to demonstrate that it was significant at the state level rather than the local level, um, and felt like that should be beefed up. Also, the period of significance was um, a little oddly listed, and I might leave that to Erica to say if you really should be calling out all of these dates in the period of significance. It was my understanding that the period of significance should be one, and then when they have significant dates, they should list those. So that was a little weird. And at different points in the nomination, they talk about a period of significance that predates any of the buildings. So we're just recommending that they um, clarify the period of significance, and they add a little additional information as to why it's significant at the state level. All right, any questions for staff? Yeah, Gary. Um, am I 
I didn't read the whole lamination, but it appears that it includes all of the existing buildings on the site. Is that correct? Yes, it does. I'm fine with that. I'm just surprised. <laughs> all right. Sorry, Kara, did you have something to add? It's a tax credit thing, I believe. OK. Uh, any other questions? No. All right. Is, are there any public comments? Please use the hand raise button. No. All right. Sorry, Dis distracted. Um, no, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. All right. Then let's move into deliberation. Um, what did everybody think about this um, nomination? And um, Erica, yeah, I'd love to hear what you think. Oh, I, I will just say that I agree with Kara's assessment. Um, you know, it's, it, it's more just to kind of clean up and make it clear, but the period of significance does not need to be broken out like that and can just be given um, significant dates that, you know, call out certain things that happened, either construction of buildings or events that added to that significance. Um, and then I totally agree that the, I do believe that it is um, significant at the state level. It just needs to be beefed up and talked more in a state context, um, not just in Denver. So I agree with the staff's recommendations. All right. Um, any other thoughts, Gary? Did you want to talk about um, all buildings being included in the nomination? No, I. I actually agree that those other buildings share significance with the main building. I was just surprised um, that they're included because when this property was first considered for local designation, um, there seemed to be quite a bit of resistance to anything that would retain the existing buildings um, on, I get the two streets, Glenarm Street. Um, but I think they're they're um, they're very much a part of the significance of the whole site. So I'll just add that um, when I was with the state, um, this you know very preliminary discussions about a national register nomination, and it was very clearly communicated that it really should include all of those buildings. So, okay. but I will say that. Um, that putting the all of the buildings on the National Register does not preclude them from being demolished. Um, it's the landmark requirements that preclude them from being demolished and and many of the buildings on the site could be demolished in the future. Thanks for the clarification. All right. Um, anybody else have any comments on this? Does everyone agree with um, the staff recommendations? Yeah, I see a lot of nodding heads, yes. Okay, then who's gonna make the motion? I can make the motion. Thanks, Larry. I move to recommend that the National Register nomination for the Emily Griffith Opportunity School at 1250 Welton Street be forwarded to the keeper of the National Register of Historic Places with the recommended edits to clarify the period of significance and provide additional information on how the school meets the state level of significance per presented testimony, submitted documentation, and the information provided in the staff report. Thanks, Larry. Have... Thank you, Gary. All right. Um, then I will call for the vote. George. Aye. Graham. Aye. Gary. Aye. Larry. Aye. Erica. Aye. Kelly. Aye. All right, we have a unanimous vote, so the motion passes. And the last one up today is for South High School at 1700 East Louisiana Avenue. Yes, this one was written by your former colleague, Kathy Corbett. Um, and it too, like the other CLG um, drafts has a few typos and that kind of thing. So we're recommending a little bit of clarification on that. Um, it is significant under criterion A for its education history and under C for architecture, for the art found in the building and for the master architects or master builders. 
um, staff is recommending that the architecture also be added for its architectural style, as that was not added in the nomination. And then we had a comment that, well, it may be outside the scope of the um, grant for this. Um, we wanted additional information on how the 1973 Supreme Court case that was done just for the amendment for East High School, um, it seems like there could be some relationship to that to South High School, particularly with um, the high Latino population that was at the school in the 70s and 80s. Um, so that was a comment of, we would love to see that added to the designation, but um, I'm not sure that that will actually make it by the time it reaches the National Register Review Board shortly. But overall, we're recommending that it be forwarded. All right, thanks. Any questions for staff? No? Any public comments? No? Nope. That's my cue, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, then let's move into deliberation. Um, commissioners, do you agree with the staff recommendation? Yeah, completely. Yeah. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Well, um, for the, those who can't see all the video, um, everyone nodded their head yes. So it sounds like we agree. And um, who's going to make the motion? I can make the motion. I move to recommend that the National Register nomination for South High School at 1700 East Louisiana Avenue be forwarded to the keeper of the National Register of Historic Places with the recommended addition of significance for architectural style to criterion C and with minor, minor edits and clarifications per presented testimony, submitted documentation and information provided in the staff report. Thanks, Erica. Do we have a second? Second. Thanks, Gary. All right, let's vote. George. Aye. Graham. Aye. Gary. Aye. Larry. Aye. Erica. Aye and Kelly, aye. All right, unanimous vote. So again, the motion passes and uh, sorry for the long meeting. Thanks everyone for all the hard work. Um, Jen, did you have something to add? Yeah, it just occurred to me that um, Emily should let you all know. Yeah, I today's my last LPC meeting. So thanks for making it a doozy. <laughs> This is what you get for leaving us. <laughs> <laughs> that must be it. <laughs> um, but yes, I'm going to miss all you guys. It's been great working with you. She what do we do awesome. now? Who's going to keep us? <laughs> oh, man. Well, she, so Emily got an amazing promotion and is working for the Department of Infrastructure and Transportation, Dottie. So we, she's not gone. She's just not with us. So um, Well, congratulations. Thank you. We'll miss you. I know. And you'll be getting miss you guys. You'll be getting emails from Heidi, our colleague, um, who's covering for her for the time being. So. Gotcha. Oh. All right. Well, good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for all your yeah. hard work. You're welcome. Yeah. My, my email will be the same. So. For Ooh, so we can still I, contact you. You could still. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what do we do when? <laughs> <laughs> It's six o'clock. The lights went out here. So, uh, oh, <laughs> all right. Well, that's our that's our cue. So it's six o'clock. Okay. I will close the meeting. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Job, yes. Thanks. Bye -bye. Good job, everybody. Thank you. Bye.